Good morning. Will uh, all sergeants please start their recordings at this time? PC recording has started. Thank you. Recordings to the cloud, all set. Thank you. Good morning and welcome to today's remote New York City Council hearing on the Committee of Civil Service and Labor. At this time, will all panelists please turn on their video? Once again, all panelists, please turn on your video for verification. To minimize disruption, please place all electronic devices on vibrate or silent mode. If you wish to submit testimony, you can at testimony at council.myc.gov. Again, that is testimony at council.myc.gov. Thank you for your cooperation. Chair, we are ready to begin. Chair Miller, you're on mute. Okay, this is the working with the three screens. Okay, good morning. I am Councilmember Idenik Miller, and I'm the chair of the Committee on Civil Service and Labor. I would like to welcome everyone to here to today's virtual hearing on workplace safety in COVID-19 era, at which we will hear the following pieces of legislation. Intro 1797, sponsored by Councilman Mark Levine, is a local law creating informational campaign concerning workers' rights under the Earn Sick, Sick, Earn Sick and Safe Time Act. Intro 2161, sponsored by myself, Councilmember Idenit Miller, is a local law establishing a board to review workplace health and safety during COVID-19 pandemic. Intro 2162, also sponsored by myself, is a local law requiring dissemination of occupational health and safety information to municipal workforce within 24 hours of receiving it from a governing body. Reso number 1479, sponsored by Council Member Justin Brennan, is a resolution calling on the governor to sign uh, Assembly Bill 8140. Uh, 8142 and Senate Bill 6266, also known as the Healthy Terminals Act. I would like to acknowledge my colleagues that are here with us this morning. We have Councilman Ms. Adams, Brennan, Lewis, Moya, Rosenthal, and the Honorable Gail Brewer. The COVID-19 pandemic has impacted the city of New York drastically over the past years, causing extensive hardship for many of us around the city. The health impacts of the loss of life caused by the virus, as well as the subsequent recession, has caused extensive hardship for so many New Yorkers. In order to properly combat COVID-19 and prevent further undue hardship, we must prioritize safety and adjust our approach to how we deal with it in the future and work accordingly. Today's hearing on workplace safety, the COVID-19 pandemic is designed to further inform the committee on how workers are being kept safe in the midst of a new potentially life-threatening disease. This needs to be prioritized for all groups of workers, but especially for the essential frontline and municipal workforce who have continued to work in person through the pandemic so that New Yorkers can utilize transportation, receive medical care, buy foods and groceries, and access all of the necessary public services. I would like to understand exactly what workplace agencies are doing in New York City to keep their workforce safe. What workers are experiencing and has and has experienced during this pandemic and what major concerns around worker safety still remain. There is still much we need to know about this virus and the body of knowledge around the best safety practices in need subject to change, as well as what we need to learn in the future. However, we do know that a great deal of the evidence supports the idea that masks, hand washing and distancing measures are crucial to stopping this virus to spread. It is therefore essential to ensure that employers that continue in their person's operations, in-person operation 
integrate these measures into their daily operations. I would also, I would also like to hear from the workers as, what, as to what challenges or issues they face, as well as their lives and lived experiences on providing a safe work environment. For those workplace agencies that are still waiting or attempting to fully reopen, I wanna hear what their plans are to keep those workers safe and to prevent further waves of COVID-19. While we all want to return to our everyday activity that we have enjoyed in our past, prior to this pandemic, we cannot just jump back without the proper safety protocols and precautions in place. Do we still prolong this pandemic and miserable effects of its, all of its brought to our city? I'm sorry, sunlight on the screens is, is bothering me. Uh, let me see if I can figure out where I am on this page here. Um, in addition to the testimonies we are hearing from workers, employees, city agencies, and in addition to the testimony we are hearing from workers, employers, city agencies, and other interested parties, we are going, going to hear several pieces of legislation today, my bill, intro 2161 and 2162, along with 1797, sponsored by Mark Levine. All seek to improve dissemination of information and guidance around occupational safety and health. These bills will respectively provide formal review of the workplace health and safety guidance, create channels of city agencies to be notified of new guidance around workplace health and safety, and allow workers to be more informed about their right to paid sick leave. Finally, the resolution we are hearing today from Councilmember Brennan calls for and to, for the enactment of state bill that would extend the state's prevailing wage to workers at three Port Authority airports, JFK, LaGuardia, and Stewart Airport. The committee thanks the administration and advocates for being here and being present today. We hope that this hearing from both, for hearing from both sides on this legislation in order to improve the, the bills themselves and best serve our municipal workforce. I would like to thank uh, my staff, my chief of staff, Ali Rasunajab, Legislative Director Brandon Clark, Senior Advisor, Mr. Joe Goldblum. I'd like to also thank Central Staff, Nuzak, Thomas, Elizabeth, and John. And now uh, I'd like to return, um, return is, is Council Member Levine available? How about we just go to Nuzak and she gives us the uh, rules of engagement for today's hearing. Sure. Uh, thank you, Chair. There you go. Uh, so we've also been joined by Council Member Levine and Council Member Brandon, who will uh, be speaking shortly um, about their pieces of legislation today. So Council Member Levine, if you're ready, uh, you can give your statement. Thank you so much, and, and Chair Miller, thank you for just continuing to be such a champion for working people in the city, and uh, especially our public sector employees, and for holding this hearing today at a critical time. In, 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 in lieu of a, uh, a formal full opening statement in the interest of time, I'm just gonna say the following about intro 1797. It is hard to think of a moment in the city's history when paid sick leave has been more important it is critical, not just for the individual welfare of families, but it's actually a tool to stop this pandemic because we need people to be able to stay home if they don't feel well and not to have to sacrifice income to do that. It turns out, according to a landmark survey by the Community Service Society, only 40% of New Yorkers know that they have protections under our city's paid sick leave law and an even lower percentage, only 32%, know about added protections that are in place due to COVID. And this is really worrisome. We need workers to know their rights so they can do the right thing if they don't feel well. And uh, this legislation, Intro 1797, would help disseminate that information by um, 
preparing signs that pharmacies can use to display this information publicly in places where we know many New Yorkers are going regularly during this difficult time. So I wanna thank again, Chair Miller for holding this hearing and for including our bill in this uh, critical package. Thank you so much. Thank you, Councilmember Levine. Councilmember Brennan. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Chair, so much, Councilmember Justin Brennan. Uh, I want to first thank uh, Chair Miller for his leadership um, in all things, but certainly in getting this important hearing. Uh, really couldn't uh, have, have come at a more important time, certainly as we're heading now into the second wave. Um, I'm in support of all the bills today um, that, that our chair is hearing, but I wanted to uh, speak about my resolution 1479, which is in support uh, of the Healthy Terminals Act. Uh, the Healthy Terminals Act made history this summer as it passed uh, the New York State Legislature as the first bill of its kind to make it through both chambers and is now on Governor Cuomo's desk awaiting his signature. Uh, if signed into law by Governor Cuomo, the Healthy Terminals Act would provide life-saving health insurance to cabin and terminal cleaners, baggage handlers, security officers, customer assistance employees, and sky caps as well. The bill simply would provide 25,000 workers, majority of which are people of color, with access to affordable quality health insurance. Um, airport workers continue to risk their health and lives during this deadly pandemic, uh, even though, you know, uh, people are being told not to travel for the holidays. We know that people are going to be traveling, and that means that these workers are going to be on the front line. So passing the Healthy Terminals Act could not be more important. Um, and the council here uh, is here to put some pressure uh, on the governor to get this done. It's sitting on his desk. We just need his signature and I think it's urgent that we protect these workers uh, by signing this law um, up in Albany. So Chair Miller, thank you really so much for putting this important hearing together today. Uh, and um, I appreciate your time. Thank you. And thank you so much, Council Member. It, it is so important that we recognize that we are, uh, unfortunately, uh, do have a, a, uh, a, a second wave on the horizon. It was very important that we at the Committee on Civil Service and Labor that we had been discussing this for some time and that we wanted to put together a substantial package of bills that really protected workers that continue to make our lives so seamless, that do the work that is so important. And, um, and so I wanna thank uh, Speaker Johnson and his team for allowing us and assisting us in, in putting this together and, um, and, and making sure that we stay ahead of the curve and, and the people that are, are, are responsible um, for delivering these critical services are safe and that their families and communities remain safe as well. So with that, we're gonna hear from today's moderator, Anusad, uh, could you jump back in again with rules of engagement, let everybody know what, what, what how the uh, hearing is to flow and uh, introduce our first panel. Absolutely, thank you, Chair. Good morning, I am Nusat Chowdhury, counsel to the Committee on Civil Service and Labor at the New York City Council. I will be moderating today's hearing and calling on panelists to testify. Before we begin testimony, I want to remind everyone that you will be on mute until you are called on to testify. After you are called on, you will be unmuted by the host. I will be calling on panelists to testify. Please listen for your name to be called. After your name is called, you will be unmuted. I will also be periodically announcing who the next panelist will be. Before we hear from members of the administration today, we will hear testimony from the following individuals, Vladimir Clairjean of 32BJ, followed by Manhattan Borough President, the Honorable Gail Brewer. Panelists, I will call on you when it is your turn to speak. During the hearing, if council members would like to ask a question, please use the Zoom raise hand function and I will call on you in order. We will be limiting council member questions to five minutes. This includes both questions and answers. Please also note that for, for ease of this virtual hearing, we will not be allowing a second round of questioning. Thank you. We will be hearing this, we will be hearing this public pre-panel, uh, pre-admin panel testimony from um, the following members. As a reminder, I will be calling on individuals one by one to testify in panels. 
Council members who have questions should use the Zoom raise hand function and you will be called on after the entire panel has completed testimony. We will first hear from Vladimir Clairjean of 32BJ. Please begin whenever you are ready. Uh, hello, can you hear me? Time starts now. Yes. Uh, thank you, Chair Miller and uh, members of the committee for this uh, opportunity to testify in support of the res uh, resolution urging the governor to sign the Healthy Terminals Act. My name is Vladimir Clay June and I'm a member of SEIU 32BJ, which represents 85,000 service pro property service workers in New York, including 8,000 airport workers. Uh, up until early April, I was a passenger service representative at JFK Airport for 11 years. I'm a first generation uh, Haitian American, uh, American and uh, the son of Haitian immigrants. Uh, we know that from the data, coronavirus has impacted communities of color hard. Uh, today, I just want to share my experiences as an airport of, uh, airport worker of color, and uh, which has shown me one of the major ways we can address this disparity by truly providing accessible and affordable health care. Uh, I've personally worked through swine flu, uh, the Ebola crisis, uh, SARS, and now the coronavirus. I feel lucky this far in managing to stay healthy despite working in those conditions. But many of my coworkers have not been so lucky and we've lost members to this virus. Um, so, you know, this hits close to home for me. Uh, the Centers for Disease Control notes that access to health insurance and paid sick leave are two of the factors behind the disproportionate impact of COVID-19 on oh, communities. Um, when compared to whites, Hispanics are three times as likely to short uh, and African Americans are twice as likely. You know, I've experienced and witnessed firsthand, I've experienced and witnessed this firsthand. 95% of my coworkers at the airport are people of color. We live in neighborhoods near the airport, particularly Queens, Brooklyn, and the Bronx, where many of us live in uh, big apartment buildings and have a uh, little room to safely isolate. You know, the coronavirus has upended our lives and it's exposed us to the difficult choices we've been forced to make uh, over the years and manage the rising cost of healthcare and stagnating wages. Uh, I have coworkers who forego thousands of, uh, who, I have coworkers with thousand do uh, dollars, dollars in medical debt. You know, I have coworkers who have diabetes, lupus, and they have to pay out of pocket for their medication. They forego their medication entirely to balance the books. You know, this is why we're asking the governor to sign uh, Senate Bill 6266, uh, Assembly Number 8142, which would ensure employers provide airport workers with a $4.54 an hour uh, benefit supplement that they can use for health insurance uh, the, the, uh, that, the, that would be covered by the Healthy Terminals Act and are for are predominantly- Time mixed by it. Uh, predominantly, uh, workers of color, um, you know, I, I'm fighting on behalf of all 25,000 members in uh, the, the airports to realize uh, this, this, this dream. And, uh, you know, it's, it's interchangeable. We, you know, I'm urging the, the council to pass the, the Healthy Terminals Act. Thank you for your, uh, thank you for your, your support and thank you for working with us. I just have. Thank you. We will next hear from Manhattan Borough President, the Honorable Gail Brewer. Time starts now. Hello, thank you, Chair, for holding this hearing today. My name is Daniel Alma. I'm a policy analyst with the Borough President's Office and will be submitting testimony on her behalf. As many of you know, uh, as a city council member, Gail Brewer uh, worked with uh, her colleagues in 2013 to override Mayor Bloomberg's veto to pass the New York City Earned Sick uh, Time Act. Um, and then as borough president, uh, co-sponsored um, uh, local law seven of 2014 with council member Margaret Chin to expand paid sick leave uh, to employees of companies with five to seven employees. Um, today, she's proud to sponsor intro 1797 with I remain proud of achieving paid sick leave for most New Yorkers 
with these two acts. Yet paid sick leave is only as good as when an employee knows to use their accrued leave when sick. According to the unheard third survey uh, conducted in 2019 by the Community Service Society of New York, only 10% of immigrant workers had heard a lot about paid sick leave, down from 31% in 2014 when the city conducted a lot of paid sick leave outreach at its launch. Only 9% of low-income workers and firms with under 50 employees had heard a lot about paid sick leave, down from 28% in 2014. Only 20% of Black New Yorkers had heard a lot about paid sick leave, down from 38% in 2014, and less than 50% of employed low-income New Yorkers knew about paid sick leave, down from 78% in 2014. The premise of intro 1797 is simple. Provide simple information about paid sick leave at these locations where people experiencing illness are likely to visit, such as pharmacies, hospitals, and health centers. With the COVID-19 test positivity rate increasing in New York City, it is more important than ever to inform anyone who may be experiencing symptoms that they are entitled to paid sick leave and should refrain from going to work. It is also important to put out accurate information to the public in light of recent changes to the city's Earn Safe and Sick Time Act amended last month in order to align the city law with New York State's paid sick leave legislation that was passed in April 2020 and took effect on September 30th. Under the state law, workers of employers with fewer than five employees now qualify to accrue earned sick leave, a welcome expansion of paid sick leave to ensure more workers are covered. I believe that as New Yorkers are exposed to paid sick leave information across pharmacies, doctor's offices, hospitals, and other health facilities, Awareness and knowledge about paid sick leave will increase and more employees will make use of the sick leave that is legally due to them. I look forward to working with you on the swift passage of this important bill. Thank you. For, uh, thank you for your testimony. Um, are there any council member questions for this panel? I see that council member Levine has his hand raised. Time so starts now. Barbara Levine, you may begin whenever. Time starts now. Thank you so much. I just want to briefly acknowledge what a four scale brewer has been on the now decade long fight for paid sick leave in New York City. And again, in this new chapter where yes, we have a law in the books, but we know that employers simply can choose to not adhere to it if the employees aren't aware of this right. And uh, that makes education a critical tool now for worker rights um, and for public health in the midst of this pandemic. So uh, really this is just a thank you to the borough president and her team uh, who have worked so hard on this issue and continue to fight now. Thank you very much. Thank you, council member. If there are any other council member questions for this panel, please use the Zoom raise hand function at this time. Seeing none, I will turn it back to Chair Miller for any remarks. I, I just wanna thank the, the, the panel for their important testimony. As I mentioned earlier, that this is something that we wanna address holistically that make sure that we're using all the tools in the toolbox to make sure that we're keeping workers safe uh, and, and, and their families safe and allow them to continue to perform their services uh, seamlessly uh, in the midst of uh, the second wave and, and hopefully by keeping uh, our workforce safe that, that will continue to uh, uh, keep the residents of New York City safe as well. So um, all of this is important. Thank you so much for your testimony. Once again, Borough President, thank you for your leadership and, and 32 BJ, thank you for the work that you're doing uh, for service workers uh, throughout the city of New York. Uh, and who's that? Thank you, yeah. Chair. I'm swearing the admin. Admin, yes. I will now call on the following members of the administration to testify. Ben Holt, Deputy Commissioner for Enforcement, from the Department of Consumer and Worker Protection, Quinton Haynes from the Department of Citywide Administrative Services, Stephen Etanani, Executive Director of External Affairs from the Department of Consumer and Worker Protections, and Jacqueline Terlange, Director for Citywide Occupational Safety at DCAS. I will first read the oath and after I will call on each of you individually to respond. 
Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before this testimony and to respond honestly to council member questions? Deputy Commissioner Ben Holt. I do. Quinton Haynes. I do. Stephen Etanani. I do. And Jacqueline Terlange. I do. Thank you. Commissioner, you may begin your testimony when ready. Good morning, Chair Miller and members of the committee. I am Benjamin Holt, Deputy Commissioner for the Department of Consumer and Worker Protection's Office of Labor Policy and Standards, or OLPS. I am joined today by Stephen Etanani, Executive Director of External Affairs, and our colleagues from the Department of Citywide Administrative Services. On behalf of Commissioner Salas, I want to share our thanks and appreciation to the Council for their ongoing cooperation and dialogue with our department throughout these difficult times. It is my hope that you are all doing well and staying safe as we head into the holiday season. COVID-19 remains an existential threat to New York City's working individuals and families. Our friends, family, and neighbors face challenges of unprecedented scope and scale. Financial fragility, truncated work schedules, and retaliation at the workplace are just some of the factors that are contributing to job insecurity across the city. Further complicating the matter is that these pressures are not from a static event, but rather an ongoing threat. I say this all to underscore that the city's response to COVID-19 is neither one dimensional nor housed in a single agency. At DCWP, for example, we work with our partners in government and sister agencies to leverage interdisciplinary expertise that furthers the city's goals for a safe and healthy reopening. Broadly speaking, DCWP contributes to workplace safety during the reopening in three discrete ways. One, it continues to enforce private sector worker protection citywide. Two, it issues and disseminates information and public guidance on local, state, and federal worker protection laws. And three, it coordinates with the city's health department and small business services to aggregate and disseminate New York State public health guidance. <clears throat> New York City benefits from having strong worker protections enshrined in statute, particularly in a pandemic. The paid safe and sick leave law, for example, continues to be a resource for New Yorkers to stop the spread and stay home from work if they feel symptomatic with COVID-19, have been exposed and need to get tested, need to remain in quarantine, need to care for a family member or loved one, or need to care for a child whose school has been closed. New York City's paid safe and sick leave law is a very broad protection that is, that is of critical importance during the pandemic. Second, the Fair Work Week law provides security and predictability to essential workers staffing local grocery stores, pharmacies, and fast food restaurants by requiring employers to give workers advanced schedules and to compensate workers for last minute and other changes to their schedules. And finally, the Freelancers and Free Act gives those working as independent contractors the right to timely and full payment free from retaliation. Critically, these city worker protection laws were never suspended and thus contribute to mitigation efforts citywide, both to help thwart the spread of COVID-19 and provide some measure of economic stability to workers. And I'd be remiss not to mention that efforts to further worker protections have not ceased during this crisis. In September, DCWP was heartened to work with the council to pass introduction 2032, legislation which expands and modernizes protections for workers under the paid safe and sick leave law. Notably, the legislation ensures that workers can use their leave as they earn it without any waiting periods, and also gives domestic workers the same rights of accrual and use as other private sector workers in our city. We appreciate your work on this and look forward to continuing to work on worker protections in the months ahead. DCWP also regularly issues and disseminates guidance on municipal workplace laws it enforces. nyc.gov slash DCWP alerts is a dedicated landing page for the public to view updated department information and guidance during the COVID-19 crisis. On that webpage, guidance and information is translated in at least the 10 designated city languages. For example, as it relates to paid safe and sick leave, current guidance covers recent amendments to the law and also gives an overview of city, state, and federal sick leave laws relating to COVID-19. In addition to the reference documents on our website, DCWP holds bi-weekly informational briefings staffed by legal and external affairs team members. 
These briefings offer a conversational venue for stakeholders to ask DCWP experts about workplace laws. The department also disseminates weekly informational emails to the same universe of stakeholders. And in June, DCWP launched another resource to the public, the Worker Protection Hotline, to answer worker questions about workplace reopening and health and safety standards. The hotline is available five days a week during regular business hours, and the public is encouraged to call and may do so anonymously, either by dialing 311 or calling 212-436-0381. And most recently, DCWP embarked on a series of 10 virtual roundtables to promote the paid safe and sick leave law. The roundtables, equally divided to address employer and worker facing needs, leverage longstanding relationships with borough chambers of commerce and community partners alike to address recent amendments to the law and compliance during COVID-19. The same landing page referenced earlier, nyc.gov slash DCWP alerts, also contains reopening guidance. Documents found on the landing page include those collaborated on by the New York City Small Business Services and Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. Each phase of the reopening has a dedicated guidance document, and more broadly, there's information for what employers must do before they reopen, what workers should expect, and resources to call if there are questions. Last week, we issued reopening guidance for domestic workers on our landing page. As the home of a dedicated paid care division, this guidance, which incorporates public health and safety guidelines, fills an important gap for this vulnerable workforce trying to navigate safety in a unique work environment. Additionally, DCWP has conducted over 334 in-person and virtual outreach events since March. This includes over 30 business education days with sister agencies, where we visited more than 2,100 businesses, disseminating guidance on safe reopening standards and helping merchant associations and businesses improve business improvement districts to distribute personal protective equipment. In the coming weeks, we'll be training New York City test and trace core staff on paid safe and sick leave law and state and federal emergency sick leave so that they are equipped to give real time feedback to those they connect with. We'll also be collaborating on informational materials highlighting the right to paid sick leave in the context of both exposure and quarantine. In all, this collaborative outreach has been and continues to be emblematic of the administration's comprehensive and multi-jurisdictional approach to informing the public about COVID-19. Turning towards the legislation at issue today, introduction 1797 requires DCWP to engage in ongoing public information efforts to amplify the rights and responsibilities of employers and employees under the paid safe and sick leave law. The bill requires development and distribution of posters, flyers, and other written materials to pharmacies, doctor's offices, and hospitals in coordination with the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. DCWP supports the intent of this legislation and its focus on the health of all New Yorkers. Particularly, considering the current pandemic, we need the public to know that if they feel unwell, they should stay home and that they have access to paid safe and sick leave to do so. Reaching people at the moments they are seeking care is a strategically savvy approach to improving public awareness. That being said, there is a fiscal impact associated with the bill. As we know, the city is in the midst of an economic downturn. So we would like to work with council to ensure those resource concerns are taken into account during our discussions of this bill. I also wanna briefly mention introduction 2161 which seeks to establish a board to review workplace health and safety guidance during the COVID-19 pandemic. While this legislation does not solely fall under DCWP's jurisdiction, it does implicate our agency to review health and safety guidance issued by both the city and private employers, assess its content and distribution, and make recommendations for future public health emergencies. Further review of the bill is needed, but I note that the City Restart Task Force established earlier this year has worked directly with each agency to review city agency health and safety guidance. We look forward to further conversations about this bill with council. To conclude, I wanna reiterate that DCWP and this administration is committed to helping our city reopen safely and stay open safely. I look forward to your questions and thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Thank you for your testimony, Deputy Commissioner. We will now hear testimony from DCAS. Quentin, you may begin when ready. 
Thank you, Ben. Thank you, Chair. Good morning, Chair Mel Excuse me. Good morning, Chair Miller and members of the committee. I'm Quentin Haynes, Executive Deputy Commissioner of the Department of Citywide Administrative Services. Today, I'm joined by Jacqueline Terlon, Director of the Citywide Office of Occupational Safety and Health, also known as COSH. DCAS, in partnership with DOHMH, OLR, Law, and City Hall, have provided guidance to city agencies on managing their office in the age of COVID-19. The COVID-19 pandemic has taken an enormous toll on New York City residents including our very own city employees who have been on the front lines responding to this unprecedented challenge. In support of their efforts, the city has implemented teleworking policies, facilitated the widespread use of face coverings, promoted healthy hand hygiene, and instituted social distancing measurements and requirements and other health and safety precautions to keep the city government functioning while protecting our workforce. We intend to maintain the steady state, teleworking for those who do not need to be at a work site, and reevaluating as necessary based on the virus's trajectory. In coordination with other city agencies, we review mandates and recommendations from New York State, as well as the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention to ensure our workplaces are grounded in a health and safety approach. Based on this work, the administration has developed formal guidance and protocols issued to all city agencies in August. The administration has approached this guidance with four categories in mind preparing buildings, preparing workspaces, preparing the workforce, and communication. Preparing buildings includes inspecting and preparing building systems, entrances, and common areas. It includes establishing and implementing new building protocols, practices to control access, promotion of social distancing, and maintenance of building health. Preparing the workspace is a closely related category that includes establishing and implementing policies and protocols for promoting social distancing through a strategic approach in the configuration and use of workspaces. Preparing the workforce means developing and implementing policies and practices related to staff, which staff will be on site, procedures for working remotely, and steps to protect employee health and well being. And also communication, which is critical to tying all of these categories together. City employees need to understand their agency steps to protect their safety and to ensure an orderly process for returning to work. It is important that agencies are transparent, accessible, and make efforts to ensure and answer questions and address the challenges through two-way communication. These four fundamental practices guide the city's plan to provide a healthy and safe workplace for all city employees. The city has also implemented mandatory daily health screenings and posted signage to reinforce habits designed to help keep ourselves and others safe. This administration is working across city agencies to examine and share best practices. We will continue to review new guidance from the CDC, the New York State Department of Health, the city's Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, and other industry leaders and experts to update our policies accordingly. At this time, I would like to address intro 2162. The Citywide Office of Occupational Safety and Health coordinates employee safety and health activities for all city agencies and provides technical assistance in implementing safety and healthy programs to reduce workplace hazards. Kosh, supports the goals announced in this bill related to monitoring federal, state, and local agencies that provide information about occupational safety and health during a public health emergency and disseminating that information to city agencies. Since the pandemic, COSH has distributed COVID-19 related guidance to agency safety and health coordinators as the information has become available. These documents direct agency safety and health coordinators to design customized employee safety protocols based on work function and potential exposure to hazards such as COVID-19. These actions are consistent with the intent of this bill. We look forward to working with the city council on this important matter. I'm happy to take questions about the categories included in the city's guidance to agencies. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. We will now turn it to Chair Miller for questions. Thank you, Nusad. Thank you, uh, Deputy Commissioners. Um, testimony was 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 uh, enlightening, um, and and obviously uh, from from DCAS we, we we expect nothing less, um, but we do have some concerns about the continuity of information being disseminated from DCAS um, to agencies, and 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 so if you can kind of speak to that uh, specifically. Um, um, some of my experiences have been that that kind of uh, precipitated this hearing was mm -hmm. was that uh, folks that are responsible for oversight and disseminating of this information 
uh, talked about the difficulty that that particularly like uh, Office of Labor Relations and and folks talking about how um, many agencies and department within the agency was involved and that there was a difficulty in disseminating real time information um, as it relates to COVID and 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 other health crises. Um, could you speak to what tools and mechanisms that you have in place that really, number one, assess the information that come in from these governing um, bodies, uh, CDCs and OSHAs and others, and how we then aggregate that to a specific industry or agency and make sure that they have that information that is necessary? Sure thing. Thank you, Chair Miller. That's an important uh, question. Um, so first, uh, let me give you the uh, kind of uh, the uh, mechanisms in which DCAS has promulgated this guidance. And so we have hosted both uh, town halls and meetings with agencies, chief resource officers, as well as human capital um, uh, HR professionals, as well as labor relations professionals, as well as safety health and coordinators, um, and also answering questions that they have about this guidance. Once we promulgated this guidance and we sent it out to these agencies, the next step that we did was we hosted these town hall sessions, both to go over the guidance in detail, as well as answer any questions that they may have. Throughout the pandemic, we have had several meetings with agency chief restart officers, both to understand the uh, issues that they're having on the ground, but also to clarify and update them on the many uh, information that's coming from the CDC on a consistent basis, as well as to educate them on the best practices that we are getting from industry best uh, practice leaders, such as ASHRAE, et cetera. Um, for, our safety and health, for our safety and health uh, officers, um, I will turn it over to Jacqueline to talk a little about our engagement, but I do want to reiterate that we hosted weekly meetings with HR professional, professionals that both go over that guidance, such as leave, uh, such as uh, any guidance that we received um, from the CDC, as well as from the state. But I'll turn it over to Jacqueline to uh, talk a little bit directly about our engagement with the safety coordinators. Uh, good morning, Chair Miller. Thank you for the opportunity to speak this morning. Uh, I'd like to at least start by explaining the process by which COSH receives uh, federal, state, and guidance material. We are part of a number of safety forums and list servers, so we review daily the federal, state, and local regulatory agencies' uh, websites to ensure that we are receiving updated information. That information is then reviewed by members of COSH and we forward that information on to the safety and health coordinators on a daily basis. Some of the information may be customized um, specifically related to a particular type or work function or group, and we forward that information on to the safety and health coordinators. In addition, our office performs a quarterly monitoring, both email and call communications with safety and health coordinators to ensure that there are open lines of communication. So um, that is occurring now. Um, and, and, and certainly we don't want to revisit where we were in March, April and May. And, and some of the things that we saw then was misinformation uh, and, and kind of agencies being protective of the brand and the product and, and that, uh, uh, and, and certainly we're not talking about MTA, but that was probably the epicenter of transmission of this disease and, and, and bus operators and, and uh, train conductors and, and others were told not to wear masks because it, was, it would scare up the customer base, it would do other things. Uh, the same with, with EMS uh, 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 was was not uh, at, at certain times allowed to 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 wear uh, a mask. Um, uh, agencies would see clients clients were not uh, uh, required to wear a mask, um, and so what we have learned about the transmission of this disease in real time, how do we get this information out? And then what is, is, is uh, how, how does oversight of responsibility, does, does, does DCAS responsibility uh, extend beyond um, transmission of this information? Um, how, how do we make sure that once agencies 
have this information that they are responsible and that this goes to the workforce and that we're protecting the workforce and in a way that, that that's absolutely necessary. And then if you could also, and I know you said uh, immediate turnaround, um, what's the actual, could you give us a timetable on that from once you kind of receive that information from these governing bodies, aggregate and send it to the necessary agency? So to answer your, your last question um, concerning the timetable, we perform a morning review. Um, and then after the review is conducted, our group then reviews the documents um, and makes the determination how to and where to send out said information. Um, so it's sent within that morning of receiving the information from the regulatory group. Um, to answer your question really concerning role and responsibilities, um, COSH serves as a technical support to city agencies in the interpretation of the language in the guidance material. Um, in addition, we assist the agencies in developing customized safety training protocols and facility checklists based on the guidance material. In addition, COSH distributes, as we've discussed before, this guidance material. And part of that is if the agencies have um, questions or specific language, that, again, they need interpreted, we're available to answer those questions. Can you talk about, I know you said that you have uh, weekly or Actually, you know what, I don't want to put words in your mouth, that you've had town halls in the past really uh, discussing um, this information uh, training with, with, with uh, various agencies. Could you speak to that? Uh, was, was, was all city agencies uh, involved? What agencies what, what weren't involved? Uh, what kind of tra training uh, occurred by virtue of this? Um, was it a uh, universal training? Do you provide specific, specific industry training? You know, what does that look like? So sure. I'll have you. Start. I'll start high level and then Jackie, you can jump in. So the initial training that I had mentioned um, before, once we actually issued the guidance, um, had worked work for categories of the various guidance. So we had a training that talked to building engineers and managers um, and real estate folks within city agencies about preparing their building. And so we went through all of the guidance that we have and how do you prepare the building that included everything from setting cleaning schedules to understanding bu building ventilation systems and what are the best practices that you should be doing in order to prepare your building. We had another session in regards to preparing your workspace, right? And so that was for similar folks, but um, we're really focused focused on uh, the real estate folks that actually um, deal with the workspace. And so that means everything from putting signage up for six feet social distancing, putting the necessary signage up as far as what is usable, what is not usable, um, uh, ensuring that bathrooms, directional, uh, directional uh, signage was placed up. And so that incorporated that um, demographic for those folks. And then for your workforce, as you know, this includes with what Jacqueline will talk a little bit about, but it had for your APOs. And so all your agency personnel officers, your labor leaders, as well as your safety coordinators, we talk Talk through what were the best practices in regards to teleworking, flexible schedules, time and leave, and all of those uh, uh, things. And so we have those uh, sessions both to not just send the guidance to agencies, but also help walk them through best practices and how to implement that guidance. Uh, because as you can imagine, the guidance went to all agencies. Agencies have different functions, and we didn't want to prescribe uh, a universal set of policies that may not be bestly or best fit for each individual agency. Um, and so that's what we did as far as those town halls, just to answer that direct question. And so agencies took from that larger piece uh, from the courses or training materials that were provided by DCAS and then met with representatives from COSH in order to develop more customized training material for their employees. Um, so, so uh, obviously, uh, DCAS is our go-to for the human capital, but you also mentioned about the reopenings and, and, and what was necessary for the real estate. And, and we have places like 100 Gold and, and other places that, that are not back up and running, right? And, and or that we have places that, that um, the, 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 the hourly or unionized workforce is actually running, management is not in the building to kind of manage and, and guide them. There's no specifics 
um, according uh, to workers um, that is consistent with what you're saying here. Like, like, how do we assess a timetable on when these brick and mortars should be up and running? What is uh, for someone uh, uh, somewhere like a, a Wanda goal, somewhere like that, for it to be um, uh, at capacity, whatever we determine that capacity should be? Should they be up and running now? Should there be still, you know, th th those are vital uh, services um, that um that are being provided that are not necessarily being provided at the level that we should because there's also um and, and i want this to be about health and safety but but you know there are folks who don't have the the, the, the requisite equipment to work from home and so you know getting people back either getting them that equipment or getting them back in the building becomes that much more crucial um but we have you know, large facilities such as this that just aren't up and running eight months later, and and we're going into a phase two. What teeth do, do does these cats have, or does this council and this committee have to make sure that that all of this information is being applied, uh, so that we can continue to provide these seamless services that the, the, the city provides. Um, on, on on the capital side, right? And so um, you talked about the reopening and we're saying that, that that's just not the case. It needs to be the case um, who ultimately uh, has the sign off to make sure that there's compliance with these regulations. And at, at, at what point, you know, does, uh, you know, how long can agencies go without providing these services um, uh, that are necessary from the brick and mortar standpoint. And how do we know? And then what, what's the correlation be, in between um, the dissemination of this information through workshops, forums to safety officers and so forth and actual implementation to make sure that it's reaching our target audience? So uh, forgive me if I miss one part of your question. I'll start with um, the brick and mortar. And so our buildings never closed. Um, and so you mentioned 100 gold. Um, that building is up and running. Um, that building is actually also managed by DCATS. And so in DCATS's portfolio for the buildings that we manage, as well as the guidance that we've given to other agencies to, to uh, prepare their buildings, that work is ongoing and has been ongoing since the start of the pandemic. Um, as you mentioned, we still do have employees that never stop working or being on site. And so we immediately, even before the guidance was issued, uh, publicly, we're doing things in our buildings to ensure that workers that continue to have to report on site had a safe um, work, safe and healthy work environment to be there to continue those essential functions. Um, and so that work still continues, but it, it didn't just start when the guidance came out. It started prior to that. Um, in reference to kind of the dissemination of information, um, we did have those forums and those town halls and those continue. Um, we are in active communication with agencies as they look through their restart plans. Um, every agency is supposed to have already started and has confirmed that they have started those implementations of the guidance that we've put out. And again, as I mentioned, that is preparing your building. That is thinking through your mechanical systems. That is looking at your floor plans and seeing the density and occupancy and understanding how many people can be in a space at one time. That is putting out uh, the social distancing stickers that you see throughout. That is also putting occupancies in conference rooms and putting occupancies in elevators, putting hand sanitizer stations throughout your buildings. Um, so that work is ongoing and it has not stopped since the pandemic. I will tell you, uh, based on this committee's information and based on the, the, the workforce and those that represent them, um, that it is really questionable. And, and as I mentioned, capacity, you know, what is the actual capacity of a building? So, and I don't want to get stuck on 100 go, but that happens to be one of the ones that, that was, uh, that we, we fielded some questions from, from the workforce about, um, uh, uh, about proper guidance um, and whether or not that guidance had actually trickled down to, to the workforce, right? And so we did talk about, you know, you can give, uh, the agency, the information, but compliance, we're talking about oversight and compliance and whether or not it's actually happening. And what is that capacity? Because you say they've been up and running, but it's, it's you know, for the most part, 
you know, it, is, is it 20 percent? Is it 30 percent? Is it 50 percent at this point? Do you know? So I don't know the actual individual agencies, uh, uh, their percentage of workers that are actually staying on site. Uh, again, I think they're, what we're looking at is the actual infrastructure of the building in which we're repairing. And that's what I meant by the buildings have not closed. Yeah. That goes into actual, the actual agency's uh, decision um, to have essential workers um, actually on site or other personnel on site. That is a decision that the agency makes directly. Well, um, I'm, I'm simply saying, have you signed, has DCAS signed off on, on, on compliance? Um, in, in, in terms of social distancing, in terms of ventilation, in terms of all the things that you determined to be necessary, has DCAS signed off on that? And then once that happens, you, you know, it's, it's up to agencies. And, and so I'm, I'm trying to figure out a, a continuity between you guys giving them the, 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 the guidance and, and, and that actual implementation happening on that one. Um, And, and then uh, 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 I did want to get back to timetables of, of information uh, being disseminated and how, how that happens as well. So the simple answer to your question is yes, DCAS has reviewed uh, our guidance and implemented our guidance to 100 gold in all of our building stock portfolio. And we are the ones who sign off on ensuring that that guidance is met from the building standpoint. How, how many buildings do we have throughout the city that, that houses city agencies? Uh, we have a lot of properties throughout the city. I know. Could you, could you give us a guesstimate? Uh, upwards of 4,000, I would assume, uh, or, or somewhere in that area of, of properties uh, that the city uh, owns. Owns or the, or the housing? Some of them, do some of them have just like a floor of, of agencies or multiple floors? Is there some that, you know? Could be. Uh, we have buildings that range from, as you are aware, uh, one center street that has over uh, 25 floors um, to small buildings like 115 Christie that is only a couple of floors. So it ranges. Um, and then we also have lease space. Um, and so it ranges the gamut. Right. Okay. And, and, but this information uh, pertaining to brick and mortars and reopening has all been given to uh, those uh, facility uh, uh, maintainers and managers. Yes. yes, sir. And it's also publicized. So if, uh, as, as, as it's publicized on our website. So if you go to DCAS uh, uh, and, or Google DCAS RTO, the guidance is actually listed under um, our four city okay. agencies um, uh, tab. And then it's right there. Okay. Um, so, and, and, and then, and, and I, I just really want to move this along because I know my, my colleagues have questions. I want to get the time uh, line thing in on the human capital. Um, but I think, uh, are you satisfied in, in, in how we reach our target audience? And is your target audience simply the agency and your responsibility? That's it after that point there that you, you, you put together this body of information and provide the agencies with that type, with that guidance. And then from there, it's up to each individual agency to disseminate and that th therein lies the responsibility of DCAS in this. And unless we're addressing uh, human capital and does the responsibility of DCAS when it comes to human capital exceed beyond um, just uh, giving the information to the agency. So that is our role, but I will say um, this is an unprecedented challenge, right? Um, we are all learning as we go. And so DCAS has also taken a hands-on approach with agencies. Agencies have contacted us um, with issues and concerns and we have worked hand in hand uh, with them to resolve those. And in some instances, we've gotten very creative. Um, and so it, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't, in normal terms, it is DCAS's responsibility to promulgate guidance um, and send that out to the agencies and it's the agency's responsibility to ensure that they're in compliance with that guidance as well as enforce and encourage and um, educate their employees on said guidance. But we've also taken an effort to ensure that agencies have those vehicles in place and mediums in place to do so. And we've been kind of a thought partner with all agencies on this. And so let, let me just suggest this, and, and, and now that we have everybody on the line in, in, this, in this open forum in this way, I know that in my reopening, which is not completely reopened, you know, at all, 
the, the office, but we have sought out DCAS in their guidelines, right? Um, simply because, you know, agencies, um, council um, provided that information and pro provided a, a, a briefing, um, but not, um, not in the same way, right? This is what you guys do, right? And, and so someone gets a briefing and, and we're getting the secondhand briefing from them. But when it comes to real um, providing all of the uh, things that we're asking today, uh, the bulletins, the safety, the cleaning, and, and all the other things that keep the workplace safe, I've actually gone directly to DCAS myself. Um, it's, 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 is this available? Uh, how, how would you go uh, to, to, to the intricacies of, of the inner agency? How would someone uh, get that information? Uh, provided that it was not readily available through safety officers or the agency. Uh, so they can contact us directly if they have not um, uh, received that information. Uh, again, it's also publicized on our website, um, nyc.gov backslash DCAS under the four year city agencies. Um, the guidance is actually listed on there. So it's publicly available for all um, to educate themselves. And we're happy to go over it both with you chair um, and others if they uh, would like to a more in-depth briefing on it. And then, and then finally, um, this guidance uh, that happens, does, does is there a time when, 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 when uh, health and safety, safety guidances and, and these bulletins that come from the governing agencies go directly to, to local agencies and, and, and kind of bypass DCAS? Uh, uh, Is there times when FDNY and, and, and other agencies uh, are, are receiving information and acting upon that information? Uh, that exceeds your responsibility as uh, 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 the governing body for human capital? Absolutely. Um, agencies, also agencies have encouraged uh, us and, and educated us on things that we have not seen. Um, and so it is a thought partnership, definitely. Um, agencies are part of their own listservs. They are looking at their own um, uh, uh, industry best practices as it relates to the work that they do in the field. Um, and as you know, uh, every uh, industry field, whether you're a sanitation worker or building engineer or custodian, have their own set of guidelines and they're the experts in this space. And so sometimes they're able to get to information quicker than we are because they're signed up to those industry forums and they actually encourage us and educate us on those. And we ensure that we share that information with others. And so if you're a, uh, if you receive information uh, from a custodial listserv or an engineer or trading listserv um, at one agency and you bring that to DCAS, we make sure that other agencies that have those same job titles and functions that we get that information to them as well. So yes, uh, it is a, 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 a fluid uh, um, and active uh, uh, back and forth on information. That, that makes sense, but it, it also leads me to wonder why then um, agencies would take such actions that really run counter to some of the information that goes out with the uses of PPEs and, 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 and things of that nature there. Thank you so much. Um, and, uh, I, and, 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 uh, I know my, my colleagues have some questions, but I, I did want to, uh, sp uh, speak with, uh, Deputy Commissioner Holt about, uh, some of the uh, challenges on 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 more of the uh, the private workforce and and the things that are happening uh, with worker protections and and and, and over at uh, consumer affairs. Um, what are some of the challenges that you see in making sure that the work that we've all done collectively to to protect workers that this information gets out? Um, and I, I, once again, I, I applaud uh, Councilmember Levine. Uh, for just his insight in saying that people that go to doctors and pharmacies are probably sick and they need to know about paid sick, right? Um, how are we reaching target audience and what are some of the limitations that you're seeing in, in kind of uh, oversight of, of, of uh, the work that we have done? Um, thank you for the question, Chair, Chair Miller. Um, and I would say that certainly uh, public awareness, whether we're talking about um, your right to paid safe and sick leave under New York City's law, or the specifics of the reopening guidelines that have been issued by New York State is an ongoing challenge. Um, and it's something that we work on very hard. 
um, you know, I highlighted in my opening remarks uh, some of the numbers in terms of outreach that we've been doing, um, uh, going out into communities to talk to business owners to ensure that they understand what their obligations are. Um, also partnering uh, with community organizations, worker centers, labor unions to try and help get that information directly to workers. Um, I think in terms of some of the related challenges aside from just getting that information out, um, when we hear from workers, uh, we hear that people are fearful about reporting unsafe conditions in their workplace um, because of uh, the fear that they may be subject to retaliation. Um, now through the worker protection hotline that I mentioned earlier, which again is a vehicle for workers to contact us specifically about uh, the New York State's uh, reopening health and safety guidelines, um, we can take those complaints anonymously, um, whether it's a complaint or information, um, but the, the fear that workers have to make those complaints is an ongoing concern. Um, and that's something we certainly would be interested in working with council to develop additional protections to ensure that workers can feel that when something is out of compliance or unsafe in their workplace, that they can bring it up without fear of reprisal, without fear of consequences. Um, in terms of the, the specifics of the kinds of issues we've heard about from workers on reopening, um, the most common um, problems we've heard about are people not wearing masks in the workplace, um, a lack of adequate distancing in the workplace, um, lack of the daily health screening that is required. Um, those are, are really the three big ones that we've heard about the most, but we've also heard about um, unavailability of PPE, inadequate cleaning or hygiene supplies, lack of the signs or postings that employers are required to put up. Um, what we have done is when, when we go out and talk to employers, um, we, are, we are trying to make sure that they understand exactly what it is they have to do. Um, our enforcement, and I'll talk exactly about how that works in just a moment, um, of the reopening guidelines is focused not just on finding violations, but also trying to ensure that employers know what it is they're supposed to be doing. So we do recognize that there is a lot of new information um, that both workers and employers are having to absorb and implement at this point. Um, with respect to enforcement of the state guidelines, uh, the, the way it has worked is the mayor's office is the centralized location that coordinates enforcement of uh, reopening complaints. So if a worker or a member of the public says, um, you know, they are not wearing masks in my workplace or we're working too closely together, um, that complaint can be lodged via the 311 system and then goes to the mayor's office. And then the effort of actual on the ground enforcement is shared among a variety of agents, uh, city agencies, including but not limited to DCP working together with the mayor's office. <clears throat> and so when we go out and, and investigate as DC, DCWP and other city agencies, again, we are looking for violations, but also working to really try to educate businesses to help them comply with this because this is not just a question about worker safety, this is also about customer safety, employer safety, safety of managers. Anyone who could be in that workplace could be at risk if the guidelines aren't being followed. Um, so we are, we are taking both um, you know, uh, an enforcement, but also an educational approach um, in the context of, of the reopening guidelines. Um, and then similarly with respect to, to paid safe and sick leave and, and other city workplace protections for the private sector, um, we've conducted over 300 um, in-person and virtual events during the crisis, um, particularly to ensure that we're reaching vulnerable populations, um, immigrant workers, people who, who we may not be able to reach through digital or other channels. This is why we partner with community organizations, worker organizations to try and reach those people. Um, and, you know, I think working closely with, with partners is very effective, but, but we recognize that it's a huge task. We live in a very large city. Um, so it is, is an ongoing effort and, and we do appreciate the, the leadership of the council um, in, in looking to explore new ways of trying to get that message out more effectively. 
Just to piggyback on on what the deputy commissioner had mentioned, um, it's it's important to note that our our outreach and educational um, efforts have uh, have taken into account um, language access in the city. Um, all of our guidance on our website um, related to COVID reopening or worker uh, protection guidance is translated into at least the ten designated languages. Um, uh, by the city. And for our um, outreach, particularly our affirmative outreach on paid safe and sick leave that Deputy Commissioner Holt and Commissioner Salas have, have joined uh, with partners like La Colmena and uh, Chambers of Commerce throughout the city, uh, virtually, uh, we've actually procured simultaneous interpretation to ensure that uh, there aren't barriers uh, with constituents um, as we're getting this critical information out. So do, do you, do, uh, obviously, you know, pay safe and sick. Um, I know early on, we, we, we did a lot of engagement, a lot of community engagement. You said very specifically talking about some of our community, local CBO and other partners in, in doing that. Um, more critical in this critical time of COVID-19 where, where we can't meet and mask and that this same vulnerable population may not have access to the apps and the IT. You know how how are we how confident are you that that we're reaching our targeted or target audience? And if you're not that confident, you know just what 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 do you think that we can do collectively to to make sure that we we're reaching our target audience and keeping people safe? Keep so, but, safe. yeah, Ben, if you don't mind, I'll I'll just take a first crack at that. Um, I think it's always a challenge, uh, regardless of the pandemic reaching uh, vulnerable constituencies. It's, it's a major reason why we, we partner with CBOs to kind of uh, a trusted voice in communities to amplify our message and, and, uh, and bring us uh, directly to, to those who, uh, who we're targeting. Um, it's, as you, as you alluded to, particularly challenging now. Um, I think we're continuing to do that work uh, through our partner agencies by, uh, by uh, uh, doing these virtual uh, meetings, but also on the ground. Um, I think, you know, as, as Deputy Commissioner Holt had mentioned, we've uh, been on the ground in all five boroughs um, in merchant and business districts, over 30, over 30 business education days, over 2000 businesses, visited in person um, and that doesn't include uh, you know direct worker and and constituent outreach um, um, in addition to that so you know it's it's a work in progress uh, where where we we look forward to working with you chair and and your colleagues um, uh, on additional events and 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 different ideas quite frankly to to see how we can kind of bridge this gap further okay thank you and and then uh, my my final question, uh, Quentin, would be how how confident are you that we're getting this uh, information out in in real time? I'm pretty confident, Chair. Um, we have worked very closely um, with the agencies and have been in constant contact um, with them. And uh, like I had mentioned before, we host a weekly meeting with all HR officers um, and, uh, you know, ha having conversations, direct conversations with them about what they're hearing on the ground um, from their employees. And if there are any confusions, we work with them uh, to clarify if there's a policy um, issue or if there is a situation or scenario that we have not addressed yet. Um, we work with them to, to uh, uh, resolve that. Um, and then also we work with them to share what they're hearing from their agencies with other agencies. So I do, I do feel very confident that it is permeating um, down to the employees. Um, it's just about getting, once we get the information, you know, massaging it so that it makes sense uh, for the city um, when we get the information from the state or when we get the information from the federal government from the state and massaging it to make sure that it's applicable to the city um, and then getting it out as quickly as possible. So, and, and then finally, uh, most, mo most uh, safety teams include, uh, include representatives from labor and management. Um, uh, uh, does, does your, um, does these uh, town hall informational sessions include labor as well, labor partners as well? 
So we did invite in the initial town halls or forums that, uh, that we had, we did invite uh, both HR professionals, EEO officers, um, labor relations folks, employee relations folks, agency safety and health coordinators, um, as well as the appointed agency's agency chief restart officer. So all of those were part of our initial discussions. Um, and I don't know, Jackie, if you want to talk a little bit about your consistent um, engagement with specifically- oh, I'm, I'm sorry, but you, but, but those, representatives from bargaining units working, work, representing workers, were they invited? You mean the actual union reps um, from the labor unions or the actual labor relations folks from the city? No, I don't mean labor relations. I mean labor reps. So we have not, um, they, those individuals were not initially invited to the forums that we had. Um, the audience for those forums were city employees. Is 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 there something that forbids you from from uh, uh, having them in the room? To receive no, um, I, I will just add that um, we have been in direct contact with OLR, um, and OLR on behalf of the city has provided our, the information that we are giving to agents. I, I disagree. That, that that is the reason why we're having this hearing because OLR told me that it's just. We have too many agencies. It's just too difficult for us to get this information out. And I wanted to hear, I, I had more confidence in DCAS than obviously OLR had. And so um, time and time again, on our weekly, very early during the pandemic, like, oh, we got so many agencies. It's, it's very hard to get this information out. The information is changing ongoing. And I said, look, I, I, I would submit that if, if, if any of this information led to, de to, to, to discipline, I assure you that you wouldn't get a paycheck unless you signed off on this information. And so when the, and, and that was the idea, how do we guarantee that these bulletins um, that could potentially be lifesavers um, get posted, get before uh, the workforce? And, and they would, they said it was a challenge. And, and that's why we're here today to make sure that it's not a challenge. But in, in, in order for that to happen, I think if we're not utilizing the unionized representatives and all of the tools in, in the toolbox, we're, we're doing the workforce and the people that we serve at this service if we're not using everything, right? And so I, I would submit that. And I'm, I'm just telling you that um, o OLR, they struggle, they struggle. And that's why we want to make sure that we have that that is happening today and so we want we got everybody in the room now and i think everybody on every side is, is committed to that and so thank you um uh, i'm, I'm going to pass it over to uh, my colleagues for questions new set thank you chair i will now call on council members in the order they have used the zoom raise hand function Council members, please keep your questions to five minutes. Sergeant at Arms will keep a timer and I will let you know when your time is up. If there are any council members who would like to ask questions of the administration, please use the Zoom raise hand function now. Seeing no hands raised. Um, I will turn it back to Chair Miller for any closing remarks before the administration is excused. Thank you so very much. And 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 um, geez, I, I am not one to, to monopolize questioning and and under under normal circumstances. Uh, and uh, but I, I know the committee, uh, Civil Service and Labor, that we have discussed this for months in in depth. And uh, hopefully I articulated the voice of, of the entire committee in, in the line of questioning. Uh, but that being said, um, I, I know that I've had the pleasure of, of, of working with DCAS for, for a number of years, uh, in fact, for the past seven years. And I've, I've often can be very critical, but I know that of all the agencies uh, that, that there when it comes to uh, the, the human capital, which is the focus of this committee, that they're generally on point, but I want to make sure that there's also continuity between those representing these workers as well. So I, I would just suggest um, that when these rooms open up, that organized labor are in these rooms as well, because I assure you that they will make sure that um, that their members are safe, that they, that is their best interest in, in doing so. And I look forward to uh, working with all of you guys uh, in, 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 and ladies in the future and um, Ben, uh, we have done, uh, I was out this week uh, doing some uh, uh, 
with local businesses uh, and and making sure that that that, that proper uh, signage and, and posting was happening. Um, but these are the times that we can't get out like we used to. Um, uh, we all want to remain safe, so let's figure out um, how we disseminate this information in the most effective fashion. Uh, thank everyone. But also, uh, I believe that we had a commitment uh, from the administration that folks were going to hang around and listen to the rest of the panel. So uh, if we could all just uh, commit to that, I'd, I'd appreciate it. With that being said, uh, we are now going to Nusat. I'll turn it over to you and you can uh, moderate the rest of the program. Here. Thank you, Chair. We will now turn to public testimony. Once more, I'd like to remind everyone that unlike our typical council hearings, we will, we will be calling on individuals one by one to testify. Council members who have questions for a particular panelist should use the raise hand function in Zoom and you will be called on after each panel has completed their testimony. For panelists, once your name is called, a member of our staff will unmute you and the Sergeant at Arms will give you the go ahead to begin after setting the timer. All testimony will be limited to three minutes. Please wait for the Sergeant to announce that you may begin before delivering your testimony. The first four panelists will be Henry Garrido from DC 37, Gloria Middleton from CWA Local 1180, Mark Henry from ATU 1056, and Oren Barzillet from Local 2507 FDNY EMS. Henry Garrido, you may begin once the Sergeant at Arms gives you the time. Time starts now. <laughs> Good morning, uh, everyone. I hope that you can hear me. Thank you very much, Chairman Miller and the rest of the city council members and the leadership of the council for putting this important hearing, hearing together. I know the focus of this hearing is going to be concentrated on the results of COVID-19, but I wanna take a moment uh, because I have been in discussions with the family members of Eduardo Callabril, who was the a uh, worker or DOT who got crushed to death by a truck while laying a uh, um, foundation uh, on pavement near Gracie Mansion. Uh, it was this one year anniversary. Uh, and I know his mother, uh, I mean, his, uh, his um, daughter, his wife, his mother, his family uh, were um, observing this hearing because they're so concerned about the health and safety of workers. He is a daily reminder of how important a role we have in the role of health and safety for the workers and how important it is to do it. Um, I think to his memory, I urge his council to look beyond COVID and to look at work-related, uh, safety-related um, plans because we've lost three different DC 37 members since my tenure here, and that's uh, three too many. So to their families, we wanna mourn with them and also thank them. Um, I would just say this, Mr. Chairman, thank you very much um, for your testimony. I, I, Henry Garrido, Executive Director of DC 37, we represent 150,000 city workers. Um, the unfortunate worst statistics of all this discussion is that we've had uh, about 152 DC 37 members pass away due to COVID-19. And that's because they're deemed essential. It's because that more than 100,000 of them are still working every day in every offices. So that's about two out of every three. Uh, and I had the unfortunate uh, task of having to call every family every time an individual passed away. Um, where do I begin? I don't think three minutes does it justice, but from the lack of uh, personal protected equipment uh, to the issue of uh, inconsistent messaging from agencies to the fact that agencies uh, kept deferring uh, and changing and modifying uh, inconsistent messages from the CDC, therefore exposing individuals uh, to unnecessary risks that resulted in the death of many people, the 152, that I believe were unnecessary. I'm going to say that again. Many of those deaths, I believe, would have been unnecessary um, because the city was unprepared and lacked the leadership that he needed to protect his own workers. And it's about to do it right now, again. 
just as we close the schools to yesterday. Um, Time expired. The same, I'm sorry, we're seeing the same thing now where as the city closes the public schools, it is doing, um, you know, it's still calling the early childhood education centers uh, as if COVID does not go into those individual classrooms. We think this is misguided. There seemed to be a dispute between the city and the state regarding the legality of this, uh, but we're exposing workers unnecessarily on the early childhood education, 3K, pre-K, and certainly on the um, a Head Start Not to School program unnecessarily. I think that we need to, uh, so I am fully in support of the two bills uh, uh, that are being re replaced here. I think further discussion is taken, and I would note for the record that DC 37 holds the bargaining certificate for health and safety beyond DC 37. We hold it for other unions as well, and we look forward to working with you, uh, Mr. Chairman, with the council to put comprehensive reform as outlined in this legislation and uh, we'd like to see it happen for the safety of the workers. Let me just conclude with this. I wanna thank you um, for listening beyond the three minutes. Every time that we do these rigorous reviews, which required legislation, we are saving lives. City workers are not spendable. They should not be in a position that they're seen as, well, they're essential workers and therefore they, they matter less. Their families are just as affected. And um, I believe it is time for this city to leave to its creed about protecting its workers and not just provide lip services to it. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll take any questions you might have and I defer to my colleagues on the panel as well. Thank you. Thank you so much, Henry. I uh, look forward to some questioning as well. Thank you for your testimony. We will now hear from Gloria Middleton. Time starts now. Good afternoon, committee chair Miller, uh, committee members and city council members. My name is Gloria Middleton, president of Communication Workers of America, local 1180. Uh, my union represents 9,000 active city administrative and private sector workers and almost 6,000 retirees. I'm here today to address the topic of workplace safety during the COVID pandemic, especially as we enter what appears to be a second wave of the virus that just seems to keep on giving. This has been a difficult year for all of us as we have learned how to navigate through pandemic life and incorporate the new norm into every aspect of day-to-day -day living. As political leaders, as government agency leaders, and as union leaders, we have the responsibility to make sure those we represent are taken care of and protected while on the job, providing the essential services that New Yorkers have come to count on. If COVID-19 has taught us anything, these past 10 months is that no one single person can fight this invisible battle alone. It takes a team, a group effort. And that's why I'm in favor of legislation that will establish a board to review workplace health and safety guidance during COVID-19 pandemic, provide recommendations on health and safety protocols for future public health emergencies, and make sure that workers receive relevant information about occupational safety and health related to any public health emergency that comes up. Like most unions, I lost far too many members during the peak of the pandemic, including a most well-loved and respected shop steward named Priscilla Caro. Priscilla was a coordinating manager who worked at Elmhurst Hospital in Queens, the epicenter of New York City's pandemic. Part of her job was to distribute the PPEs to make sure everyone working with patients with the public at Elmhurst had face masks, everyone but herself because there wasn't enough to go around. If the city had stricter guidelines on health and safety protocols earlier this year, Priscilla Caro and hundreds of others just like her might still be with us today. But what does concern me about this proposed legislation is the lack of labor representation on the board. With nine available seats, certainly one could be set aside for a union leader. After all, we are the voice of the 350,000 plus municipal workers who need the health and safety protocols in order to remain protected on the job. I do realize that the mayor, the speaker, 
of the council and the public advocate have a combined total of five seats and that they can fill it at their discretion, but that does not guarantee that they will fill any of them with a labor leader. Inviting quote, relevant experts and stakeholders, including but not limited to those representing uniformed and non-uniformed municipal I'm expired. is not good enough. I respectfully request that the legislation be amended to include a guaranteed labor seat on the board. This would do, go a long way toward ensuring that workers do not have to worry again about having enough face masks, enough gloves, enough hand sanitizer, or enough disinfecting wipes as Priscilla Caro did earlier this year. And thank you for allowing me to speak. Thank you, Gloria. Mm -hmm. Thank you for your testimony. We will now hear from Mark Henry. Time starts now. Thank you, Chairman Miller and the colleagues on the City Council for this opportunity to present on behalf of the Amalgamated Transit Union, Local 1056 uh, in Queens, and our neighboring locals, uh, 726, 1179, and 1181. My name again is Mark Henry. I'm the president and business agent for the local and also chair our, our statewide conference board, which represents over 2,500, 25,000 uh, transit workers across the state of New York. And while these hearings don't focus on, on per se on MTA workers, it, it remains important to emphasize the special plight of our transit workforce on the front lines of uh, against COVID-19. The impact of COVID certainly impact our civil servants in public transit. This includes the members of my local and the riding public. As you may know, members, our members operate and maintain buses for New York City Transit uh, throughout Queens, Bronx, Brooklyn, and Manhattan. Uh, we were initially not even recognized as essential employees by the agency. We suffered with the agency not providing us the proper PPE, stating this type of equipment wasn't part of our job function. We don't want to harm the public, you know, where us wearing masks. Uh, they forced the unions into purchasing PPE items for their members. Uh, there were a lot of indignations that were done. They didn't follow their own playbook in regards to the pandemic. Uh, transit workers in, in whole, you know, are unable to shelter in place uh, due to the lack of them not reacting in a timely fashion. We ended up losing 33 of our brothers and sisters to this virus. It was, uh, took its mental toll on our, on our membership and, and to this day, we are still suffering. We are still trying to seek some type of shelter and home uh, type workplace environment because again, we cannot shelter in place. The priority of our local is always to provide health and safety for our membership. Uh, proper PPE is always should be mandated, should be mandatory and it should never be questioned the way it was questioned to us in the beginning of this pandemic through the, the early part of this and the height of this pandemic. Uh, the ATU uh, supports Chairman Miller's work of safety measure T206717 in establishing a, a, the, the board to review workplace and healthy safety guidance during the COVID-19 pandemic. And we also support his other piece of legislation T2020 6607 in relation to the dissemination of occupational safety and health information to the city employees during uh, this health emergency. Um, again, I, I know there are many members on this panel that have helped our, our plight. As you know, we are without a contract, which is another indignation uh, that is being bestowed upon an agency. Time expired. And we ask that, you know, we, we thank those members who have supported the ATU and we are here to testify on behalf of our members. If there is any other resource you need, uh, I'm available for comment. Thank you. Thanks, Mom. You're welcome. Thank you. We will now hear from Oren Barzile. Time starts now. Oren, you're on mute. Hold on one second. Is that Elizabeth? Yeah. 
Can you guys hear me? Yes, we got you now. Thank you. Okay. Good morning, Chair Miller and committee members. My name is Owen Barzillet. I represent the FDNY EMTs, paramedics, and fire inspectors. Thank you for giving me the chance to speak to you today regarding work workplace safety in the COVID-19 era. Our members appreciate your continued advocacy, and especially now as life is even more challenging. We appreciate your commitment to protecting civil servants. There is no question that many of the challenges this city has faced with regards to COVID-19 pandemic has fallen on the shoulders of first responders and healthcare workers, of which FDNY has taken a lion's share. To date, we have lost seven members to the virus over almost the same amount of months. Hundreds of our members have contacted the vi contracted the virus and gotten ill. Dozens have developed long-term permanent health issues. In, in March of this year, Crystal Cadet, one of the speakers at our rally last year to address the culture of discrimination and disparate treatment within the FDNY, contracted the disease, battling for her life for months on life support. She is still not able to return to work and has a long road of recovery ahead of her. The impact of the mental well being of these members on the front lines of COVID also cannot be overstated. Some members have resigned their job due to the overwhelming death they have witnessed. Some are showing signs of PTSD when at work by either breaking down while at mid duty and going home sick. Unfortunately, while EMS first responders have shown up to answer the call of duty, risking their lives to save others, our department continues to demonstrate their lack of commitment to protecting our EMS first responders. Almost immediately after the virus hit our communities, the fire department made moves to protect their firefighters. In fact, in early March, while Crystal Cadet lay on a hospital bed, hooked up to a ventilator fighting for her life, the FDNY issued orders pulling firefighters from answering medical calls that described symptoms associated with coronavirus. But our members did not object. EMS first responders are the experts best suited, most skilled and best trained to respond to these dangerous calls. We understand the risk associated with our work and New York City's EMS first responders are some of the best in the world. We just don't know if the city understands or respects these risks. Where was the department to rush in and protect us? Instead, our members were put in unnecessary, more dangerous situations while being paid what amounts to minimum wage. Simple things like asking us, simple things like asking us what we needed, ensuring basic PPE was put in place timely, not even seven months after it was needed, setting up protocols and paying attention to our members not to mention considering extra pay to help cover the costs and sacrifices our members made. Being away from their families day after day as they rushed into what is in essence was our burning building would have gone a long way. I'm almost done. We have, we have seen how the COVID pandemic adversely impacts communities of color. Similarly, predominantly of color first responders are often forgotten, underprotected, and ultimately also adversely impacted by COVID-19. Rather than ensure we had proper PPE, the city directed our members to only wear N95 masks when we were intubating patients. Meanwhile, we would not be allowed to wear masks at scenes where airborne pathogens could lead to illnesses and possibly death. Under evaluating our members put their lives unnecessarily at risk, but it also puts the greater community at risk. In March, around the time the department was issuing orders of protect, protection for its other members, it issued an order for EMS first responders that even if you were exposed or tested positive for COVID, we should report to work as long as we were not symptomatic. In high, hindsight, even the city can underst understand how shockingly thoughtless this was. Not only did this put our members in situations where they were not able to care for themselves, but they are then simply spreading the virus to their coworkers and their patients. 
The oversight that this body offers, as well as the workplace oversight board being proposed, are des desperately needed so that we can learn from past mistakes and better protect those on the front line, risking their lives for all of us. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. If there are any council members who have questions for this panel, please use the Zoom raise hand function at this time. Okay. Um, thank you so much to the panel. Uh, um, the stories, this reality that, that represented by these workers that are represented by these women and men that, that have testified this morning is, is, is just reinforcing the need for, for the work that we're doing here. Uh, let me just say the glory of that, that amendment um, certainly is already in, in, uh, in the works uh, that labor absolutely has to be at the table as we indicated with DCAS and the administration uh, earlier. It, it doesn't work without that. Uh, to Henry. Um, Appreciate that, Chair. Yeah, th th thank you. And, and certainly the work um, that you talk about that is ongoing around worker protections, the work that we did around uh, um, a workers' comp to be able to evaluate, assess um, why workers are getting hurt. How do you, you know, where those challenges lie, not just worry about paying out uh, uh, benefits, but fixing the problem to be able to assess that data and looking at that. And then um, to, to make sure that we extend benefits for those dependents who have lost their loved ones because of COVID. This is ongoing work that has to happen and because of the communication that, but uh, let me just, be, you know, just the line of questioning, you know, I, I, as I, I, I listened to Mark, I, you know, I'm reminded that NYU study said that one in four transit workers had been touched in some shape, form or fashion by COVID and, 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 and more likely than not have con contracted it while on the job. We certainly know that the New York City transit system was the epicenter of COVID based on the number of transit workers, based on the number of people that utilize the system on a regular basis. You know, for, for, for all and, and, and your members or in for, for what they've gone through, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm just reminded that my, you know, your instructor and my, my good friend, uh, uh, Idris Bey, uh, um, <laughs> who was, you know, was ill in 9-11 and, and, and because of the inequitable package was forced to continue working and, and end up dying in, in, in COVID. It is, it's just in, incredible. It is incredible the contributions and the sacrifices that are made by these public employees that make our lives so seamless. And the fact of the matter is, wow, yeah, schools have closed Henry, but guess what? All summer long, your members were in the school building. All year long, your members are in the school building when some folks get to sit at home and 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 and, and pontificate uh, about what's wrong. There's some of us that have to show up, and and oftentimes those are the men and women of of color, unfortunately, that you represent. All of these bargaining units are represented by predominant folks of color, which is a microcosm of what we see nationally. And so, this is a conversation that that we're having. How do we keep these folks safe? And, and, and by keeping them safe, we are keeping the public safe, that all of their clients, all of their customers, all of the people that we serve each and every day in such a seamless way, um, that, that is really dependent on keeping this workforce safe. Uh, and I, I really appreciate um, the efforts that are made. And, and I just wanna hear from you guys that, is there anything um, based on the testimony that you heard from DCAS and, and others from the administration uh, that we can add or do differently. And then I also, uh, based on my conversation, that's, that's really, as I said, that, that really initiated this hearing, the desire to do this hearing was um, the admin and, 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 uh, and agencies saying that they did not have the capacity to put out in real time uh, these bulletins from these government bodies because they represented such a such varying industries and and whatever nuances uh, that prevented them from doing that. As I said, if they want to discipline you, they know how to find you. They know how to get you that information, right? And um, and 
with technology, you know, could could we provide an app the, um, that would would uh, be specific to uh, these municipal employees in particular agencies? Um, if there's a will, there's a way, and there has to be a will to keep workers safe. So, is there anything that that um, that we didn't hear in a specific testimony that we think that we can speak to? So, Mr. Chairman, if I may, Henry Garrido again. I think on the issue of PPEs. Uh, and the issue of consistency of policy. Um, I, I just want to highlight something that took place. In, in the peak of the early stages of the first wave of the pandemic, our members were desperately needing for PPEs, right? And for the most part, people identified that as being N95 masks, which there was a short supply of. Uh, there was this dispute between whether people could use surgical masks, and N95s and professionals. Many of our members were actually dealing with patients and others um, that were dealing with fluid transfers. And we said, hey, is there a possibility that we could have some information about the use of poppers? Um, these are personal equipment that protect the face of the individuals with a filter in the back when you're dealing with bodily fluids with people who are already sick. This is on hospitals in other areas. And what we found is that many of the, you have some hospitals that had them, some hospitals didn't have it. Yes, some hospitals that had part of the equipment, but didn't have the filters. And uh, to Oren's point about uh, the unnecessary risk that people were doing. Well, one agency was telling the members, um, if you come in contact with something, someone who was COVID infected, um, and you're treating them, you ought to continue to work until you begin yourself to show symptoms. This is inconsistent with another agency who's saying, if you know you're treating a patient who is COVID related, you have to self quarantine for seven days. While another agency was telling yet another set of employees, if you come into contact with somebody that is COVID-19 or somebody in your household has been already identified as having COVID-19 positive, in many cases, spouses and children. We need you to stay home and, and be in quarantines for 14 days. Three different agencies, and all three at work are all related and work very closely together. Fire Department, h and &H, and DOHMH. Three separate agencies who are all responsible in one way, shape, or form to execute, deliver, and and bring us to safety, right, during the COVID-19. And yet those three agencies have inconsistent uh, recommendations for their own employees as to how to handle getting in contact. In the meantime, as Oren said, and I, as we've seen it, those same workers were coming home, bringing their the disease and, and having to interact with their families. That's unconscionable. Um, we work very hard to get legislation to allow the families of the surviving COVID-19 related death to take their benefit. Uh, we just had a hearing last week where we've had 386 individuals who applied for COVID-19 related death and the family. Most of them have been approved locally because we were able to clarify the legislation with the state. But the truth is we very uh, often don't talk about the effect on the families and the detrimental effect of the surviving families is horrible. And so what I would suggest, Mr. Chair, is two things. One, that in terms of the communication, this agency that the legislation is proposing be responsible to coordinate even intra-agency organizations, uh, communications. And secondly, that it would be to fill a price at least of the stockpilings of PPEs, the distribution, the lack thereof. And finally, that it does uh, um, provide some sort of analysis or serves a service a resource centers to the surviving families of those who were perished as a result of doing their jobs in COVID-19 and saving us all. And those are three recommendations that I think the agency should concentrate in addition to what's already been said. And it doesn't have to be a major investment. It's a matter of priority, right? It doesn't have to be you know, millions of dollars. We have people who could do that, but what we need is better coordination and we need to start acting like one city 
as opposed to a combination of 169 agencies. Thank you. Thank you, Henry. Uh, Gloria, did you want to add something? You're on mute. I'm, okay. okay, now I'm unmuted. Um, I, I totally agree with what Henry is saying. Um, on a personal note, my son works for transit and he did contract um, COVID-19 and thankfully he's okay, um, but he's back to work. Um, so him and his family is praying every day that he remains okay. As for my workers, there is a staff rep out at ACS today because my workers are giving out PPEs to the field workers, but they're not allowed to have but so many PPEs for themselves. There has to be more coordination and more understanding of how we protect our members. Um, we still have issues at H&H. &H. They sent out a policy yesterday about if you, you can only stay home if you have um, the COVID-19, if you were in contact with somebody, the quarantine time is not the same as it was before. It's, it's so much um, different information with different agencies that people are confused. We're, we're looking at that policy today. And, and Henry, I hope you saw it because I know it affects your members too, because it's, it's just not making sense. So, um, Gloria, it, 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 Gloria Henry, because you guys represent members in multiple different agencies, mm -hmm. are you seeing guidelines such as this different in different agencies? That's not consistent. Yes. No yes. Consistent. Without a doubt. Yes. yes. That's not consistent. Um, and, and some agencies, they're not cleaning at all. They're telling members, you have to clean your own work area because they don't have the people to do the sanitizing that they're supposed to do. This is insane as the second wave is about to happen. And we, we just have to come to some clear understanding. That's why if they're going to have a board, labor has to be on it because we can tell you what's happening. A person representing the agency is not, and I'm sorry to say this, DCAS or whoever, they're not going to say the truth. <laughs> okay, we're going to tell you the truth because our members are there. Um, so I appreciate this um, opportunity, Chair. I appreciate what you're doing um, and the other council members. This is much needed as we go into these holiday seasons where we know the numbers are going to go up. Thank you. Hey, and, and, and finally, hey, Arlen, um, are, are your members responsible for cleaning their own cabs, the, the trucks, or do you have cleaners? That, that that keep the, the booths, the, the ambulances uh, clean? We, we are responsible to clean our own vehicles. Our own and, are, are there instructions as to PPEs and, and, and what, how they should be cleaned in differently in the time of COVID than, than uh, in, in the past? So it's just recently we received this uh, equipment uh, that deals with that. It's called the Clorox 360 machine. It, it basically uh, sanitizes the entire ambulances in, in a few minutes. And, and, and everybody's been trained? I don't know if you would call it training. Um, they, they stop by, they drop off the machine, uh, and they tell you, this is what you use to uh, wash the vehicle. You know, But when they drop off the machine, not everybody's there. You know? Right. And to further that, uh, our department is so concerned with stats uh, that they're not even given time to disinfect the machine. As soon as they come, some stations allow them. Some stations say, no, you got to go to your to your area of response. They don't give them the chance to disinfect the ambulances. You know, okay. and, and if, if I may go back to the PPE, I don't know if you remember, I'm not sure if it was your committee in March 5th of this year. There was a council hearing about the city's preparedness. Yep. And then, and then, some I'm not sure which uh, outlet it was, whether it was the Post or the Daily News. A few weeks later, released a article saying that after the test, those testimonies on March 6, they finally placed orders for PPE the first time. After four months of hearing what's going on in Asia, on March 6, they decided to place the first order. Uh, this week, one of our stations received uh, gowns 
that are not medical gowns. That they're ordering stuff that we don't even have, to, we, we can't use. Okay. So I just want to I want to thank you all for, for your testimony. I hope that you know this hearing is 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 helpful um, that in keeping members safe and keeping the public safe as as we move forward. And we're going to be in constant communication. And and again, um, the board will certainly reflect uh, organized labor to make sure that that voice is being heard as well. So, um, Nusat, if you thank thank you all. You call the next panel. Thank you, Chair. Our next panel will have the following individuals. Anthony Almahera from UEMSO Local 3621. Delvani Powell from UPOA. Saul Fishman from the Civil Service Bar Association of the Teamsters Local 237 affiliate and Susan McQuaid, Health Director from the Teamsters Local 237. Anthony Elmohara, you may speak whenever the Sergeant gives you the go ahead. Time starts now. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Anthony Almajara. I'm the Vice President of the FDNY EMS Officers Union, Local 3621. Thank you, Councilman Miller and all those in attendance. I am happy to be here to testify, but I wish I was here to say all things are good and we have fully learned all the lessons from the first round of COVID back in March. But that's not the case, especially for those of us in the FDNY EMS. Yes, we have received new masks, but we are still missing so many things that will make us not only more resilient to second and third waves, but also to responding to medical emergencies overall. While Mayor Nero played his fiddle and told us to keep going to the movies and continue shopping, we in EMS watched firsthand this city burning from this pandemic. The darkness enveloping the city was only illuminated by the lights on our ambulances, providing hope for all those who can hear it. But this has come at a great cost to us. As of today, we have lost five EMTs to COVID. Four additional members have committed suicide. And we still have numerous others who are out long-term from the effects of being sickened with, with COVID from helping others. In addition to our tragic losses, we had over 25% of our workforce sick at one time, and those numbers are starting to go back up. We were told that members who are light duty due to job injuries or modified duties pregnancies were still to report to work and risk exposing themselves and others unnecessarily. This policy still has not changed. As Councilman Miller stated, we were told to wear lesser masks. So this day, we still don't have dedicated rapid swab testing for 911 providers. I have found, I have personally found companies who are already treating the Department of Education, et cetera, in New York City, but have been told no by the city and the department to accommodate us in 911 and especially EMS. We have to go stand online at city MDs like everybody else. The mayor recently announced the mental health initiative and EMS will be at the forefront of this program. But this is a bit of a slap in the face as we do not have adequate mental health care for ourselves. We are so short in this area that the unions had to find outside independent of the FDNY agencies to provide these mental health services to our members. Absolutely, citizens should get this care, but shouldn't the ones providing it also get this care? Sick leave was mentioned and we are in e we in EMS only get 12 sick days a year. After our sick leave is exhausted, we go off payroll and lose our benefits, a tragedy in the time of COVID. GoFundMe is being used as a backup medical insurance for us in EMS. Just for reference, cops, firefighters, corrections, and sanitation have unlimited sick. I'm expired. Those treating the sick shouldn't worry about when they get sick, they, lo they lose their benefits. Our workforce reflects the city we serve. We are 54% minority and 38% women. We are the most diverse 911 agency, but the least paid, $35,000 less than fire and PD. We have half the benefits. COVID has hit the minority community inordinately worse than others. And we reflect those statistics. 
A recent study showed that FDNY EMS providers were 20% more likely to be infected with COVID and 90, 90% more likely to die as opposed to firefighters. Our job is just as dangerous and always has been. This pandemic has only highlighted it. We need the help of this city council and others in government to get us what we so rightly deserve, equal pay and benefits for equal work. The worker safety panel is needed more than ever. And I thank you, Councilman, and everybody else who's sponsoring such things and for your continued support of us in EMS. Thank you. Thank you, Anthony, for that testimony. Thank you so very much for your truth. Thank you. We will next hear from Delvani Powell from UPOA. Time starts now. Good day, Chair Miller and Civil Service and Labor Committee. My name is Dalvany Powell and I'm the president of the United Probation Officers Association, representing probation officers throughout the city of New York. When the city shut down in hopes to stop the spread of COVID-19, the members of the United Probation Officers Association never stopped working. The department instituted mobile schedules where the members continued to supervise our probation clients, conduct investigations, prepare reports and intakes while they were able to work remotely. The members reported to the office intermittently while they continued to make home visits and practice social distancing. We did not skip a beat. Even though we lost a member to the disease and at least 35 of our members have fallen ill. Prior to COVID-19, the Department of Probation was two or three hours short of being 24 hours. However, since COVID-19 hit, since COVID hit, we have now become a seven day a week and 24 hours a day agency. As a result, rather than, rather than taking steps to limit our exposure to COVID, we have substantially increased contact with the, pro, with, with probation, with the probation clients, excuse me. We would like to see the city take active steps to reduce risk for our members. Even the basics like providing PPE can go a long way. Every life matters and every exposure matters and has a ripple effect. Just making it a priority to value our work and pay attention to the impacts of the pandemic could go a long way, which is why we thank this committee and for its work in addressing the issue. Also, there's a sense that the city is not paying attention to the way this pandemic impacts our members. Our members are committed to our probation clients. We participate in volunteer activities outside our, du our duties responsibilities, such as the distribution of food to probation clients and their communities throughout the Department of Probation from our neon, neon locations. Our concern is keeping the members safe when interacting with thousands in need. We are also concerned about what happens in the winter months at some of these locations, the members are standing outside distributing food. Again, it's not that we do, it's, it is not that we want to stop doing this work. Our members are hardworking and committed to our communities. We want the city to help in ensuring safe practices and reducing risk. We have never stopped making field visits with, each, with, with them, with various health, but we have various health concerns. Rather than taking the steps to protect us in this work, the city has leaned on UPOA members, asking us to perform duties outside the scope of our responsibilities under our collective bargaining agreement. By way of example, due to the COVID-19 concern audit, the, the city ordered the release of inmates of, of Rikers Island. Without offering any additional pay or protection, the mayor's office ordered our members to handle these releases. As a result, the department reinstituted the electronic monitoring unit to monitor these individuals as well as those probation clients who are not in compliance or in violation status. This is this is out of title work for which we were not giving time proper, expired. Proper PPE despite exposing our members to additional risks such as going into the field, interacting with individuals to attach the braces, entering residences and homeless shelters and etc. We continue to work because our members we continue to do the work because our members are professionals and rise up in times of hardship for this city. But will the city remember, our, remember or recognize this, especially when they don't even properly outfit these members with the proper PPE? There are non-expensive steps the city can take if, if they are prioritized our safety, such as plexiglass, to place on each office's desk to, to, meet, with the pro, to meet with the probation clients. But the city has fought installing these, I'm sorry, but the city has fought installing this suggesting we have to share the plexiglass between desks, which would be impossible, not safe, and would raise issues of handling and cleaning the plexiglass or even injuring our members when they're carrying it. We, will like, we will look forward to working with this committee 
to learn better ways to address the pandemic moving forward and protecting our workers in the era of the COVID-19 and beyond. And I want to just say, um, um, Councillor, that I agree with Mr. H with Henry and Gloria very much so because the best ones that can tell our stories is those of us who's doing the work. Thank you so much, uh, Madam President. Thank you. We will now hear from Saul Fishman. Time starts now. Good afternoon, uh, Chair Miller, distinguished committee members, council members, fellow labor leaders, and concerned New Yorkers. I am Saul Fishman, president of the Civil Service Bar Association, which represents the attorneys who work hard and smart each day for virtually every city agency, large and small, as well as for the Housing Authority and the Transit Authority. We have a touch over a thousand members and are proudly affiliated with Teamsters Local 237, which has around 24,000 members. Uh, our members are dedicated city employees. They believe in their agency's mission and are a key part of making sure that the laws that this body and others enact are enforced equitably without favor or discrimination. Many toil a lot of hours not to become rich, which they certainly will not become on city salaries, especially given their crushing student debt. Uh, but I'm not here today to complain about those things. We can and should have those conversations another day, rather to discuss keeping city workers as safe as possible and to recommend the passage of intro 2162, the bill before this committee. As we've learned during this hopefully once in a century pandemic, uh, which has already killed more than 250,000 Americans, knowing as much as possible about the risks we are facing, whether those risks are in our neighborhoods or our workplaces, you name it, it's essential to keep ourselves and our families and coworkers as safe as possible. This bill would require information be sent to each employee tailored to their position's risk. Who this this bill is, and it is a good bill, uh, and the Civil Service Bar Association and Teamsters Local 237 support it, there's much more to be done more unnecessary risk being inflicted upon city workers that need exposure and prompt intervention. As we testify safely remotely today, several CSBA members in the fire department are being forced to participate in person in meetings and hearings with extremely high risk respondents and witnesses, including emergency medical technicians, which uh, whom Mr. Barsley uh, well represents and we heard from a few minutes ago. Indeed, the uh, FDNY's own chief medical officer conducted a study concluding that EMTs are much more highly uh, to be COVID infected than the average New Yorker. These meetings can, should, and in fact have heretofore been conducted safely and effectively remotely by teleconference. By contrast, and ironically, the mayor's office of labor relations, which handles step three disciplinary grievances, is only meeting remotely. We met remotely with them and the fire department to try to resolve this issue, but they failed to intervene to have these workers kept as safe as OLR is keeping itself. Arbitrators handling the final step, step four disciplinary. Time expired. Uh, may I uh, please uh, conclude? Uh, 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 Arbitrators handling the final step of the process via the Office of Collective Bargaining are also meeting exclusively online. Indeed, all responsible entities are following guidances for remote hearings. Uh, for example, the Family Court, uh, which handles important abuse and neglect cases involving children, remote, uh, meets remotely. I know because uh, we represent approximately 200 uh, ACS uh, Family Court Legal Services members, many of whom uh, have contacted me about the challenges presented by remote hearings. Uh, and of course, as uh, we all know, uh, all city uh, public schools have switched back to 100% remote only hearing. So I'm respectfully asking that this committee investigate and act to stop the city agency's short-sightedness and hypocrisy while supporting the good work advanced by this bill being considered by this committee. Moreover, I'm also asking that this committee and DCAS reaffirm the ability of city workers to safely telework wherever it can uh, be done effectively. Uh, as we speak, my members at several agencies are being asked to return to their offices to do exactly what they can and have been doing effectively from home. With that, 
uh, I'm requesting that my colleague uh, from Local 237, uh, Health and Safety Coordinator, Susan McGrath, uh, McQuaid, I'm sorry, <laughs> Susan McQuaid, uh, briefly uh, address this committee. Thank you very much for this opportunity, Chairperson Miller, uh, committee members and friends. Thank you. Thank you, Sal. Thank you. Thank you. We will now hear from Susan McQuaid. Time starts now. Hi, my name is Susan McQuaid and I'm the Health and Safety Coordinator at Teamsters Local 237. Uh, we represent 24,000 members, most of whom work for the city. The good majority of them are deemed essential and on the front line from the very beginning of this epidemic. Uh, we have workers at the Housing Authority, the H&H &H Hospital Police and School Safety Agents, peace officers at CUNY, security officers at city agencies, members in schools, jails, medical examiner, homeless shelter, a lot of places. Uh, we have lost 71 members to the virus, uh, active members, which is just an awful statistic. Um, issues around sufficient PPE and confusing policies are also our experiences. So I will just agree with what everyone else has said. We have experienced the same. Um, yes, and intro 1797 is a really important initiative to ensure that all these workers in the city know that they can be paid when they're out sick. This is a, a real concern about sick time, you know, essential workers, uh, they don't get to take sick time if they're around somebody who's sick, thereby possibly infecting somebody else, or those who can quarantine. If they do not develop COVID, then they have to use their own sick leave time, and many of them will say, I don't have sick leave. So this is an ongoing issue that we face at various agencies. Uh, Saul uh, Fishman mentioned the support of the informational bill. Um, this, of course, is absolutely essential. I also want to echo on training. Many times workers say they've asked me to do temperature screening. They haven't explained anything to me. I mean, the, 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 the training has been lax in many places. But most to focus on your last bill, which is about the uh, establishing this board, which echoing Ms. Middleton and others, that this is absolutely essential and would be a real welcome addition um, oversight is really needed by DCAS and others. As Mr. Fishman just talked about, we're fighting with some of these employers to really employ what we say is in the DCAS guidelines, yet they don't seem to be following it. So what is our, what is, what can we possibly do? I understand that it's difficult that there's so many agencies, but with the interpretation of these guidance is being left sometimes as everybody is talking about different amounts of time to be given, really leads to tremendous amount of confusion and actually concern for the exposure, undue exposure of people to some of these, um, some of these uh, uh, possibilities that could happen. Um, all proceedings of this board should be made public and we would suggest that hearings be held to address major concerns. Um, again, input from workers and their organizations at every stage to ensure that all issues are being addressed with an eye towards best protecting New York workers. Please consider the board will remain in place, not for a fixed period of 180 days, but for the length of the health emergency at hand. As we're entering our 10th month of COVID, it's clear that continued involvement of the board throughout the emergency as new issues arrive is going to be beneficial. Um, Again, just trying to get some consistency and where we can go when we find agencies are not following. I am guidance. expired. Uh, just one more. I had an issue where people calling and telling me they wanted a training for 125 people to set up. Uh, and But they went down to 60, which is even too much. So agencies just kind of interpreting it on their own. And we really need some arbiter to get in. And it's not just enough to send out guidances. There needs to be some overnight oversight mechanism in place to be able to ensure that people can get what they need to make sure uh, their members are all safe. Thank you. Thank you so much, Susan. Thank you. That is all we have for this panel. Chair, if you do not have any other questions, we can move on to the next panel. I did just want to thank this panel and, and I look forward to them. Saul, you had your, something you wanted to say? You wanted to add something, Saul? Could you take them off mute, please? Okay. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, I just want to make sure that I, in, in the rush, I, that I didn't uh, skip over mentioning the, uh, the BITS unit within the fire department uh, where, where they're being asked to, you know, there were rules written specifically for this one unit uh, to, to go in and where any one party can request an in-person uh, hearing or interview. 
that if any one of them asks for it, that you have to go in and basically risk your life in person, that just doesn't comply with anything. And I ask that be investigated and, uh, and just want to make sure it comes to your attention and to DCAS's interpretation, because I have no idea what kind of, what kind of uh, guidelines they think that it is, but that, that just, it shouldn't fly, it shouldn't be allowed, it's terrible, and I appreciate your attention. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to, I want to thank the panel, but I will say this, what we're learning here that there is a particular agency that, that, that has a real problem. I think that we've known that from the onset of just how they distribute the work in an equitable way, how the services and the PPEs get and compensation get distributed in, in a certain way. And we're going to be paying uh, particular attention to FDMY. Uh, as well as others. And uh, uh, Madam President Powell, if you want to add something? One second, you, you still, there you go. Okay. I wanted to add that um, when it comes to, like Erin was talking about the, um, the vehicles that we need to put on the um, to-do list or the, or the bucket list, the cleaning of um, the cars that because of COVID, they need to be more mindful of keeping them cars clean on a regular basis. Um, I think if my members get wipes, if some of them get that, some of them doesn't even get wipes to wipe the cars down. That needs to be something that be, they need to be more mindful about doing with these Absolutely. Things. Because so many people use the cars and stuff to the point now my members are even kind of apprehensive about using the department's cars and using their own public cars. And then one more thing, our cars are so small, we use Prius. And I got like football players. Right. How much social distancing can you do if you got these little tiny cars and I got, you know, okay. two or three people in the car. So I just want to put that out there too. We need thank issues. So okay. Thank you. Right. Okay. Thank you so much to the panel. I, I appreciate you speaking your truths. It's so absolutely important to get into where we need to be. Uh, thank you for your service and the service of your members and uh, look forward to working with you in the future. Lucette? Thank you. Our next panel will be Jose Santos, Health and Safety Coordinator from SSEU Local 371, Josh Kellerman from RWDSU, and Zubin Soleimani from New York Taxi Workers Alliance. Jose Santos, you may begin. Time starts now. Jose Santos, are you there? We'll get back to him. All right. Yeah, well, it seems we're having some technical difficulties. So we'll now hear from Josh Kellerman. Time starts now. Hi there, glad you can hear me. Um, thank you, Chair Miller and members of the committee uh, for the opportunity to testify. My name is Josh Kellerman. I'm the Director of Public Policy at the Retail Wholesale and Department Store Union, RWDSU. Um, our members work in retail grocery stores, pharmacies, food service, food processing, car washes, nursing homes, airlines, nonprofit social service organizations, and more. A significant portion of our members have been working through the pandemic in the food supply chain and in healthcare. I'm here to testify today in support of all four bills that are before the committee. Uh, but first, I want to talk about COVID-19 uh, and its impact on our membership. Um, I can't overstate the impact of it on the members of RWDSU. It has been deadly. Over 40 members have, been, have lost their lives to COVID. It has resulted in the workers in the grocery store industry, many of whom earn the minimum wage, fearing for their lives every day they show up to do this essential job. It has caused untold misery in the poultry and meat packing industries, and it has put enormous strain on our healthcare workers. Many workers in non-essential industries like apparel retail and car washes earn low wages and had little financial cushion prior to the crisis. These workers will continue to need financial and other support as the pandemic continues. We have coordinated funding drives to financially support our furloughed members and have coordinated food drives as well. 
We have also spent an enormous amount of time educating union and non-union members alike about the resources available to them during the pandemic, testing, PPE, sick leave, unemployment insurance, workers comp, workers comp. Many workers, particularly in non-union workplaces, were surprised to learn of all the benefits available to them, highlighting the importance of education and outreach. Our experience in New York is that a clear plan with enforceable standards can set the right trajectory in motion. For example, requiring that all customers in retail and grocery must wear masks has created a clear standard that everyone can understand. Employers have responded to this clear standard as there is almost no store in NYC that lacks a sign on the front door saying no mask, no service. There's no doubt this work, that this policy has saved workers' lives and contributed significantly to lowering the curve on infections. Clearly, enforceable standards from the government create a clear standard for employers to follow, and ultimately, it is the workers who are protected. Um, let me also note that prior to no mask, no service um, standard being put in place, most union employers already had such a requirement in place. Why? Because unions have bargaining power in the workplace. We demanded that our employers from the outset do the most to protect their work their workers. This is the value of workplace democracy in moments like this. So let me turn to the uh, four bills. Uh, first, uh, the Healthy Terminals Act. Uh, our local uh, RW Local 1102 represents thousands of workers in the New York City airports, primarily in airline catering and terminal concessions. Uh, most of these workers do not get health insurance from their jobs and instead rely on Medicaid or other publicly funded programs. And many others go without insurance. Time expired. Um, so we support the health, we support the resolution of the Healthy Terminals Act and are glad that y'all are doing that. Um, let me just note a couple things about the other uh, bills. Um, we'll, uh, on the informational campaign on earn safe and sick time, we'd be happy to attempt to work with our employers at unionized pharmacies, food retail and apparel stores to put this information in front of customers. So we'd love to be in contact with y'all about that. Um, and uh, like one of my uh, colleagues in the labor movement mentioned earlier, um, we would love to uh, have a labor representative on the board uh, reviewing guidance during the pandemic. This is not just important for getting this moment right, but also for creating a blueprint for dealing with future pandemics. So uh, thank you very much for the time and uh, look forward to answering any questions. Thank you. We'll hear from Zubin next. Time starts now. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you, Chair Miller uh, and members of the committee for allowing me the opportunity to speak. Uh, my name is Zubin Soleimani. I'm a staff attorney at the New York Taxi Workers Alliance. Uh, we represent 23,000 TLC licensed drivers in the city, um, including about half of them who currently drive for companies like Uber and Lyft, which have mis uh, consistently misclassified these workers uh, as independent contractors. Uh, and this has serious consequences when it comes to these workers' ability to access uh, paid sick leave. I'm definitely in support of the of the intro expanding notice requirements about earned sick time. Um, but what drivers and other commonly misclassified workers need is a secure and predictable uh, right to paid time off when they're sick. Drivers shouldn't have to worry about the financial burden of not working when they're sick, and passengers shouldn't have to worry about whether their drivers are sick. Um, the problem of uncertainty um, with these commonly misclassified workers is that. Um, even though the DOL has found Uber and Lyft drivers on uh, the state DOL to be employees, um, the test that is used to determine um, classification is so complex um, that it's so easy for the companies to not comply prospectively. Uh, and it involves and determining whether they are employees or not uh, is fact intensive under the traditional tests and involves a lot of time consuming litigation, extensive delays that get in the way of workers getting these benefits when they need it, getting them quickly. Uh, and along these lines, so I would urge this committee to pick up intro 1926, uh, which Councilman Lander had introed earlier in the year that would use the simple ABC test to determine employment status for purposes of the city's earned sick and safe uh, sick time act. Um, and we have a cautionary tale of what it looks like to try and enforce uh, these emergency benefits when workers need them under the complicated test we've had. Um, you know, when, when Uber drivers first started filing the unemployment context uh, five years ago, one of our members waited 11 months to get his benefits because the DOL said they couldn't figure out whether he was an employee or not. And it took a federal lawsuit to get that case moving. Um, when the pandemic rolled around and 44,000 drivers for Uber and Lyft ended up filing for employment status, 
um, it took six months and a preliminary injunction from a federal court to get those benefits paid out on time uh, when it should have taken two weeks, in large part because the companies have still not complied. And the DOL took the position that, well, you never know, you always have to determine these things on a case by case basis. You know, by now, the Court of Appeals, for example, has decided that Postmates delivery workers are employees. The, the DOL decided that Uber and Lyft drivers are employees. So, so the question around these workers isn't really, do they have these rights or should they have these rights, but are they going to have predictable, secure access to them? And the best way to give time workers, expired. Um, the best way to give these workers a clear expectation of their rights and to give employers clear expectations of their responsibilities is to implement the ABC test for the Earned Sick Time Act. Uh, and very briefly, I'll, I'll just say, you know, in the months to come, you'll be hearing a lot from these companies, most likely, and their lobbyists, that they can't do this, that flexibility employee benefits are fundamentally incompatible. And that's wrong, and that's been wrong. Uh, whether workers can accrue paid sick benefits based on the hours that they do work has nothing to do with their flexibility. These are the same arguments these companies made uh, when the, this council passed the minimum driver pay rules and the sky didn't fall. Uh, drivers have been receiving New York State unemployment benefits as employees since 2016 and the sky didn't fall. Um, the path to getting these benefits should be clearer and more efficient. I urge you to pick up intro uh, 1926 as a way to provide that clarity and also to provide an example to those in the state and in other governments that, that, that workers and governments that care about workers aren't gonna be bullied into rolling back the rights that, already, that workers have already earned. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify. Thank you for your testimony. We will now circle back to Jose Santos. Time starts now. Hi, good afternoon. Can you hear me now? Yes, you yeah. can. Okay, thank you. First of all, I would like to thank Chairman Miller and the committee for inviting SSCU Local 371, the Social Services Employees Union, to this hearing. And I also, I would like to thank my president, Mr. Anthony Wells, for uh, allowing me to testify at this hearing and provide my testimony. Uh, my name is Jose Santos. I'm the Health and Safety Director of SSCU Local 371, a mighty, mighty union. In 1996, I started employment with the Human Resources Administration as a fraud investigator. On 2001, a group of 371 members, we volunteered to work in ground zero because that's what we do. We help people. I am responsible for the safety and health of 22,000 city employees. As of today, we have lost 43 members. The reason that I'm here today is to testify about my experiences when I go on location. First of all, let me congratulate DCAS for putting together such, uh, uh, for compiling together such a back to work uh, reopening plan, which I have a copy and I use as a guide when I do my, um, when I do my walkthrough. Many of our members are still working remotely and they have demonstrated that they can do their work effectively working from home. Others still working throughout the pandemic. They are called essential workers, but they don't get essential pay and they're not getting essential protection. Okay. Uh, oh, they work at the parks department. They work at the homeless services, Department of Corrections, Administration for Children Services, and many others. Now, this is where things get complicated. Some agencies are starting to bring workers and units into location without notifying the union and without allowing us to conduct a walkthrough to reassure that the agency is in compliance. The worst agency that I have seen is the Department of Correction. It is a mess. They have their own practice, social distancing. They don't have the proper PPE. You can make an inmate wear a mask. Uh, there's no um, locks, very important. I must mention this is locks because this is throughout all the agency, cleaning locks because we have people on these locations, they wanna make sure that the bathrooms are clean. They wanna make sure how often the, the, the bathroom were clean, when, who did it and what so. 
We also want to know when the filters were changed. When we go to the unions, time expired. We go to management and we ask them for the reopening plan. They look at me like I'm talking uh, another language. They're not aware. Okay. Uh, the best agency I have seen so far is the Taxi and Limousine Commission. They 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 perfect. Okay. Now. The members are calling us, telling us that they've been mandated to report back to work and they're not giving them enough time so they could uh, take care of childcare issues or family issues, okay? And on top of that, the union is not being notified, okay? When we conduct the walkthrough, we ask to see what is the reopening plan at, but they're not posted, okay? Uh, hold on a second, please. I'm a little bit excited because I've been waiting for this moment and I could see some light at the end of the tunnel because so far I've been clutching against the wall. I have members at Rutgers Island. They were called in, they were working remotely. Now they call them in. They had reasonable accommodation, but now when they come back to work, the agency have taken the reasonable accommodation away, okay? Also, retaliation. After conducting a walkthrough at Rutgers Island and Manhattan Center, the agency conducted a raid and they took all my members' personal belongings. Some of these officers, they were convert they were cells, detaining cells, and they were converted into offices. Some members had air purifiers in there and they took them away. Now the membership look at us like you know, they did because they did that because you guys were here. They retaliated against that. On the correct, uh, 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 if you get a, a, a mask at the correction, you have to sign for it. You have to sign for a mask. They say they provide masks, but when I look around, everybody is wearing their personal mask. So that raises a flag. So if you're providing, if you're providing PPE, how come they have their own personal mask? Okay, uh, HR8, HR8, we have centers open. We provide services at HASA. So the agency, pro, uh, they bought plexiglass on a bulk. So the plexiglass is about 16 inches wide with an opening on the bottom, on the bottom part. So imagine yourself right now, councilman sitting with a 16 inch, piece of plexiglass in front of you with an opening at the bottom. But there's something in between you and the plexiglass. Your computer monitor is right there. So the clients, when they turn in their documents, they can because it's blocked by the, by, the, by the monitor, okay? So the next thing to do, there's a big gap between your cubicle and the next cubicle. So people, what they do is they tend to tilt over and talk through the opening, defeating the whole purpose. So not a uh, decast, like I stated, they put a wonderful plan, a, a beautiful uh, manual. However, all their agencies are not following. You see, Taxi Alimoxin did. Uh, uh, regarding... Um... Jose, can you begin to wrap up, please? Thank you. Okay, I'm sorry, Councilman, is that I'm, I have so much to say, and I think that three minutes or five minutes is not enough, okay? So we need to protect our members. they essential workers. So please give them essential protection. Thank you. Thank you, Jose. As, as well as, you know, you could also submit written testimony so that we can follow up on the specifics that of whatever um, we didn't talk about here today, okay? And certainly, Anthony's in my ear every day, so um, we're hearing it. Thank you so much for your testimony. Thank you to that panel. Um, again, I will remind any council members, if you would like to ask a question of any of our panels, to please use the Zoom raise hand function. Our next panelist will be Claudia Schachter de Chabert from CUNY School of Labor and Urban Studies, Charlene Obernau from the New York Committee for Occupational Safety and Health, 
Emerita Torres from Community Service Society of New York and Joel Kupferman from the Environmental Justice Initiative. First, we'll hear from Claudia. Time starts now. Thank you for the opportunity um, to speak today. Um, I'm Claudia Schachter Deschabert, an adjunct lecturer at the School of Labor and Urban Studies, uh, CUNY. Um, as a city worker myself and someone who teaches city workers, I have seen the devastation of COVID-19 up close. I applaud the city council for holding this hearing and the proposed initiatives which will positively impact the health and safety of workers in New York City. In keeping with the mission and values of the School of Labor and Urban Studies, worker health and safety is a basic human right. No worker comes to work to die. To the extent that city legislation can play a role in ensuring that workers have a healthy workplace, um, we support um, and highlight um, some of the bills. We would support them all. Um, establishing a board to review workplace health and safety measures during COVID and in the future is a good idea. It's important to have a timeline within which to complete this work. And as the second wave lurks all around us, it's important for this work to begin now. We would also support um, 1797-2019, which would create the informational campaign concerning workers' rights under the Earn um, Safe and Sip Sick Time Act. Making workers' rights clear to working people is key to ensuring enforcement of those rights. And finally, although it is not the subject of this particular hearing, we, along with New York Committee on Occupational Safety and Health, um, would call on, um, and uh, as well as others in the labor um, and uh, labor unions and community, call on New York State to pass the legislation New York Hero. Um, that would create enforceable standards uh, statewide to protect workers from COVID-19, including protocols on testing, face masks, PPE, social distancing, hand hygiene, disinfection, and engineering controls. Thank you very, very much for the opportunity today. Thank you. Thank you, Claudia. Thank you. We will now hear from Charlene over now. Time starts now. Uh, Charlene is muted. Hi, can you hear me? Yep. Hi, my name is Charlene Obernauer. I'm the executive director of NICOSH. Thanks for giving me the opportunity to testify. As many other folks have said, today in New York, workers are in crisis and um, are particularly in crisis as a result of the second wave hitting New York State and New York City. Um, workers are not only facing health and safety risks on the job, but are also facing record numbers of unemployment. And essential workers have been exposed to COVID-19 hazards since the virus emerged. Um, many have gotten sick. We don't know the exact number because we don't track that information. Um, and many haven't quite chosen to go back to work in unsafe conditions, but have been forced to due to economic necessity. And workers are at risk partially as a result of the Occupational Safety and Health Administration not doing its job. Um, simply put, the agency is asleep at the wheel. They've issued guidance, but no enforceable standards whatsoever. To make matters worse, they aren't enforcing already existing standards. There also have been you know, questions about the science, about you know, COVID actually being transmitted uh, via aerosolized particles. This has been you know, widely understood in the scientific community, but has taken the CDC a long time to actually acknowledge. So there are significant issues with the way that OSHA has handled um, you know, this pandemic and the way that the Trump administration has handled this pandemic. Um, but to speak specifically to the legislation, first on intro T2020, 
6717, which would establish a board to review workplace health and safety guidance. Uh, we support this legislation. Um, we think we need to be smart about making improvements to our response in the case of emerging infectious diseases. And we think that creating such a board would bring together some of the best strategists to figure out where New York City's response could be improved. We agree with the other speakers that having a labor representative on the board would be excellent and would be pretty essential. Um, we also believe that this legislation um, does need to have a specific timeline that is tied to the pandemic, which another a speaker spoke to. Um, it shouldn't, shouldn't be a restricted timeline, but should be you know, uh, presented in that way. And also, um, we'd like to know, you know when this process would be started. Um, it's somewhat unclear as to when exactly we would um, begin, begin the process of putting together this committee. Um, second, we'd like to address intro 1797-2019, which would create an informational campaign concerning workers' rights under the Earned Safe and Sick Time Act. We also support this legislation. Um, you know, the question becomes like, who do workers call when employers violate workers' health and safety? Um, if they call federal OSHA, our perspective is nobody's gonna come. Um, and these are the kinds of questions we get every day from workers that we train. They're being exploited at work and they don't know what to do about it. Making workers' rights clear to working people would be essential to ensuring that people can really enforce their rights on the job. So we would support that legislation. Um, finally, we know it's not the subject of this hearing, but it's important to note that NICOSH is joining Time expired. in labor and the community to call on New York State to pass New York Hero to create enforceable standards to protect from COVID. Um, again, I know this isn't the subject of this hearing, but given the risks associated with COVID, we felt it important to note. Thank you, Sherlyn. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. We will now hear from Emerita Torres. Time starts now. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. My name is Emerita Torres, and I'm the Vice President for Policy Research and Advocacy at the Community Service Society of New York, where we work to, up, to advance upward mobility for low-income New Yorkers. We have been leaders in the fight to expand protections and benefits for low-wage workers, including efforts to pass paid sick days laws. I'm here today to explain why the city council must pass intro 1797, which would require the Department of Consumer and Worker Protection to create an ongoing information campaign to educate the public of their right to paid sick leave. I wanna thank council, Councilman Miller, Council Member uh, Levine and Manhattan Borough President Gail Brewer for the relentless support of intro 1797. As the city grapples with another surge in coronavirus cases, it is critical that New Yorkers are aware of their right to take job protected paid sick leave under the city's existing paid sick days law. Recent analysis of our 2020 unheard third survey, which polls low income New Yorkers across the city, revealed that a majority of New Yorkers have heard little to nothing about federal, state, or city paid sick leave laws. Unfortunately, as you heard earlier today, just 40% of New York City residents said that they had heard about the city's own sick days laws, and even fewer, 32%, were aware of the state's COVID-19 sick leave law. Even more disturbing, however, is that many low-income workers know little to nothing about federal, state, and local paid sick leave laws, even though they are actually the ones who can least afford to take time off to quarantine and stand to benefit the most from these measures. Only 39% of low-income workers were familiar with the city's paid sick days requirement, just 37% knew about the state's COVID-19 leave, and only 37% knew about the federal act. Research has shown that when people have and utilize paid sick leave, it leads to healthier families and communities. For example, a study from the 2009 flu outbreak found that workers with paid sick leave were 30% more likely to be vaccinated against the flu and were more likely to seek treatment when they were sick with flu-like symptoms compared to those without paid sick leave. Another recent study found that the general flu rate in jurisdictions with paid sick days, sick days laws, excuse me, fell by 5.5 to 6.5% after the laws took effect. With more New Yorkers visiting healthcare locations for COVID-19 testing, intro 1797 will be a simple and very low cost way to get the right information to the right people at the right time. Widespread posters would also improve awareness among employers and the general public, making it harder for the most vulnerable workers to be denied their rights. In closing, with the city poised to enter the second wave of the coronavirus pandemic, we urge the city council to pass intro 1797. We know that paid sick leave laws can help prevent the spread of COVID-19 by enabling low-income workers to stay home without fear of losing their jobs or their paychecks. But these laws are only effective if workers know about them. 
Now more than ever, every New Yorker needs to know about their right to paid sick leave. For Time expired. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. The final panelist on this panel is Joel Kupferman. Time starts now. Thank you very much, Chairman Miller. Um, I just want to quote from your, here, your statement. However, as many workplaces tend to be sites of regular frequent interactions at close quarters, they could serve as incubators for viral spread. And that's what they've been doing. Um, science has shown that virus is tougher, more persistent, and more dispersed than originally thought. Ventilation is the key um, to making the workplace a lot safer. Ensuring adequate ventilation through the work environment can help maintain a safe and healthy workplace. Our industrial hygienist, Monona Russell writes, one day there was no COVID-19 and the next day it was everywhere, including in the air. Soon it was clear that masking with cloth, distancing and sanitizing would only work when the air was not highly contaminated, that the building operators needed to control the amount of fresh air coming into buildings and replacing contaminated air. However, older buildings often have no ventilation systems at all and relied on occasional air sources such as windows and doors. Buildings with heating and air conditioning HVAC systems often had limitations due to the system's age, design, limits, or poor maintenance. In addition, building managers often assumed incorrectly that systems performing in compliance with appropriate building code standard would be sufficient. The virus spreads because it's aerosolized and using fans and, and just windows actually helps spread those viruses. And it's very interesting that all this information that's been proposed is information that's coming down from information that's available by, by Google or Zoom. You know, what's important that's not coming up is information that's coming up from the site themselves. We filed a PESH report. We represented people at Moore, the teachers that were very upset, they were scared to go into schools that would now are, are, are turned to be closed. Building, um, the buildings were inspected. The school construction authority used forms that got smaller and smaller after the COVID virus took place. These reports and these inspections are meaningless and are actually aspirational in terms of giving false information and false reliance on incomplete information. They used just a, um, a, a poll with, with a tissue to determine whether uh, um, the air was clean enough in schools and that turned out to be totally false and bogus. The city should ask how could they inspect 1700 schools in one week and tell us that they were repaired. That information was not challenged. And after all of this, the schools have finally closed. We're proposing that we do a really strong um, investigation using the, the metrics um, such as six air exchanges per, per hour, MERV filters of 13 to 17 filters, and a maximum amount of air. I'm expired. Okay. I just want to say one thing that, uh, just one thing more in, in closing, that Part of the problem is that people are still scared, workers are still scared to report what's wrong. We filed the PESH report, the state just um, shoved it aside and just saying, do it to the executive authority, they can't do it. I think it's important that New York City look at, at, at whistleblower protection for their workers. I'm speaking to workers, nurses, teachers, and everyone else that are scared to speak out. And I think it's not just making a call, I think it's important for them to, to feel like there's some protection that, that's there. And also, I believe that there should be an ombudsman that's appointed, that's someone that they, that they could be trusted, someone that's actually proactive and not reactive. Most of the, our, our information that we've given to the city has been fought and it would, we're told, and I would call them apologists, they keep on telling us the minimum amount that the city has to do. We have to ask about due diligence, that all these places and sites should be inspected and that there, there are good standards out there that we will provide from um, AILA, um, and including uh, OSHA, and uh, American Society of he ASHRAE, whose standards show that it, um, regular old regulations can apply, the American Conference of Government Industrial Hygienists. Um, and I think it's really important that ventilation be taken back on, on, into, the, into the burner, and that if we don't have clean air, no matter how many times people wash their hands, um, people are going to continue getting sick. 
but I think it's important to put more teeth and more enforcement in this because just giving more information is letting everyone slide and believing that the city is actually changing things. We have to put in much more engineering controls to bring that back and to make sure it's safe. And also we should use citizen science where we should make every worker a monitor. This, everyone has a phone, everyone that phone could, could measure temperature, could measure other currents, and that gives people a chance to do a prima facie case. The second thing that we want is that workers now can't bring in outside industrial hygienists to test to test the sites. They're just relying on, on city hired ones. I think it's important to change that law. We have to really open up the science um, to, ev to every worker and make every worker's eyes um, as, as, a, as a monitor. And I think it's also incumbent upon city council to hire more people, not just the 90 day um, um, panel. I think it's really important that they hire their own staff, their own industrial hygienists, their own engineers, so they could critically um, criticize what the city is doing, what the mayor is doing, to make sure that the proper information is not misinformation that we're getting. And also the information alone has been really slow in coming out. The one more thing is that even the controller had to sue the mayor to get important information. So just data alone is not gonna do it. We're not getting the full data. I think it's really important to put that teeth in. And after being the environmental attorney for the UFA, after 9-11, it took us years to get the firehouses cleaned and they're probably still not clean. And the city told them over and over again that their fireplaces were clean, that the contractors that hot, got hired to clean the fire trucks missed all that World Trade Center dust and they never were, were reprimanded. So a lot of us are sitting here today, went through the 9-11 experience, we testified in city council years ago, and I think the lesson learned is that we have to be much more belligerent, um, and also we have to use due diligence. And we want to make sure that if there's anyone that's giving us misinformation, that there be some type of reprimand. Thank you. Thank you. And we're willing to we're, we have many materials to provide to city council. Thank you, Thank you. this for the panel? Yes, this is. Uh, we have one more panelist. Um, if we have, are there any hands okay. raised from uh, colleagues? No hands raised at this time. Okay, thank you. Then we'll thank you so much, uh, Noel. And 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 let me just say this: how critical this panel. A lot, a lot of the uh, initial panels were, were folks that represent workers, but the people that really provide the critical research and information um, that's going to be utilized to keep people safe or a part of this panel. So I want to thank you and keep that coming. Look forward to working with you. Okay. We're going to go to the next panel, please. Thank you. We have one more panelist left. If we have inadvertently missed anyone that would like to testify, please use the zoom raise hand function and we will call on you in the order your hand is raised. Our last panelist is Ligia Gualpa, director of the workers justice project. Time starts now. Um, good afternoon, um, everybody, um, especially uh, Chairperson uh, Miller, um, for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Ligia. I'm the executive director of the Workers' Justice Project, a workers' rights organization um, that has a state opened as an emergency and relief center for immigrant workers and families during COVID-19. Since the pandemic, WJP has been serving over 6,000 immigrant New Yorkers who are playing a central role in the economy and the recovery of New York's, uh, of our city. Our members are cleaning, um, disinfecting, delivering food, and providing critical essential services without health and safety protections. These jobs have not only become one of the most dangerous jobs of our city, but also these jobs are done mostly by immigrants who are the hardest hit communities by COVID-19 crisis. Immigrants were not only excluded from government and system, but are being denied basic time leave, personal protective equipment, health and safety training and other worker, and other worker protections. While we support, um, we strongly support these resolutions and, and legislation attempting to protect workers, um, we mo we want to strongly recommend that there, there that there needs to be done more, but mostly for low wage immigrant workers who work on unregulated 
industries such as house cleaning, um, workers that are working for the new economy, which is online based platforms, which has become essential work and is being intentionally misclassified to deny workers um, the ability to get paid sick time leave, the ability to work with safety and dignity. And just to give you an example of what these conditions look like and the struggle, I'm here with one of the members that is Sergio Acce that is gonna briefly just explain you the challenges and what are some of the demands that food delivery workers are asking for New York City, from New York City. De delivery y también soy miembro del proyecto de justicia laboral. Pues como deliberista somos esenciales porque nosotros durante la pandemia nunca hemos dejado de trabajar, pero somos los que nunca se mencionan en ningún lado y hemos estamos, hemos sido excluidos de todo y necesitamos que nos tomen en cuenta. Necesitamos cosas básicas. Hace unos días tuvimos una una marcha, una protesta grande que hay, somos miles los que nos estamos organizando, lo que necesitamos son cosas básicas. Necesitamos acceso a los baños, necesitamos seguridad, ya que el robo de las bicicletas ha aumentado últimamente. Necesitamos acceso a espacios públicos donde podamos calentarnos y pasar el invierno. Y también no sé cómo estará esto en el verano, pero necesitamos espacios donde descansar y esperar turno para poder trabajar. Somos esenciales, somos los que hemos mantenido a los New Yorkinos con su comida en la mesa. So I'm going to brief, I'm going to briefly translate um, and then um, end my testimony. My name is Sergio Che. I'm a, one of the thousands of essential workers um, that have been feeding New Yorkers. Um, but we're like as one of the many essential workers that had been forgotten and nobody speaks about it. We are the workers who have been risking everything and have not stopped uh, working since COVID-19. We are the workers that are um, that recently decided to organize one of the largest marches being organized by food delivery workers with the, with the only hope to get some basic demands that we think we deserve as essential workers. One is access to bathrooms that is being denied by the restaurants because we no longer work for the restaurants, but by the online platforms. We're asking for the most basic thing, which is access to health and safety equipment that we're consistently being denied because we're not considered workers, but we're considered independent contractors. We're asking um, for a dignified space to wait for work because we no longer work for the restaurants restaurants. Now the winter time, we only have to wait in outdoors without being able to have a dignified space to work and also to protect from the harsh winter weathers. We're also asking for um, help for safety because the streets have become that our workplace, we're consistently being exposed not only to e-bike robberies, but also to violent act of crimes against um, delivery workers. Um, and I'm just going to end by saying that um, work, um, Sergio has, it's one of the more, it's one of the 50 more thousand workers that are delivering and feeding New Yorkers, delivering food and making sure that every New Yorker is fed throughout the city. Also, these are the workers that are facing the uh, ruthless, are becoming big victims of exploitation and putting their life at risk without the ability to have a safe workplace. What we're asking is specifically, um, as Sergio said, they need to be able, they need to start regulating online platforms who are putting at risk, not only Sergio, but thousands of workers who are being denied the ability to use a restroom, the ability to have um, um, workers' compensation, the ability to be uh, paid medical bills when they get injured every time they go and attempt to deliver food to delivery to to New Yorkers. Um, and not only that, the ability to have and earn a dignified wage so they can live with dignity um, in one of the cities that they call home. We urge New York City, we urge city council members, we urge every person here to take at serious what delivery workers are facing in New York City, not only to attempting to put the 
right protections that they need, but specifically thinking how the city is going to respond and protect every other essential worker that is on the front line that is doing low wage work in unregulated industries across New York City. Thank you so much. My name is Ligia Walpa. Thank you so much. Thank you, Gracias. Um, do, are we? Thank we you. Should, should uh, once, yes. Uh, once more, if we have inadvertently missed anyone that would like to testify, please use the Zoom raise hand function, and we will call on you in the order your hand is raised. Seeing no raised hands, we have conclude, concluded public testimony for this hearing. I will now turn it back to Chair Miller for closing remarks. Okay, Nusat, um, I'm, I'm sorry. Um, I, I did have a, a question for Lizia, um, and, and, and that was about um, the, the access to PPEs and, and, and training for these service workers, these uh, low wage workers. Uh, that are essential and provide such critical services to New Yorkers. Um, what, what, what is the method and, and, and who are some of their community and, and government partners that provide PPEs and training? If, 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 and if that is not the case, how, do, how can we assist? So just to give you a quick example, one of the biggest issues with online um, food or uh, app-based food delivery workers is that uh, because they're intentionally misclassified as independent contractors, um, they are, they're, the, the companies nor the restaurants um, are providing personal protective equipment. And I think one of the most critical things to understand is that with food delivery workers, it's not only being able to access a mask, right? It goes beyond that. And in order for workers to actually protect themselves, they have to invest thousands of dollars in health and safety equipment. And we're talking about the right proper helmet. We're talking about using best. We're talking about making sure the bikes have the right proper equipment to make sure there's no accidents. We're talking about making sure the right jackets are, are being used whenever they're delivering food. So I think one, one of the most critical things for New York, for, for New York City and City Council to take into account is one, making sure how we can think about regulating and mandating that these apps who are profiting out of the labor of workers, who are becoming one of the most profitable business in our city, not actually are mandated not only to provide masks, but are mandated to provide the right proper equipment whenever they're hiring food delivery workers. And one of the things that um, delivery workers are asking is that can New York City can city council members allocate a public a space for them to warm up for two, three hours and have access to a dignified bathroom? Can city council mandate restaurants to actually provide access to bathrooms every time they pick up a food from their restaurant? Can that happen? Okay. That is, you know, something, certainly something that we're going to take into consideration, as well as some of the others that is in, in, in the written report, but certainly I'd be willing to have further conversation uh, with you and on, on this as well to be able to provide not just the, the PPEs and the equipment, but more importantly, um, you know, Dr. King says that all labor that uplifts humanity uh, has dignity and should be undertaken with painstaking excellence. And, and that's where we are, right? So this is this is about the dignity of workers as well. So we, we certainly want to work with you on that. Um, I want to thank everyone for this uh, hearing. It is uh, clearly we can do this for another four hours, another four and a half hours. There's so much information uh, uh, that is necessary um, in order to keep workers safe and protected in order for workers to continue to provide the critical services that make the lives of New Yorkers so seamless. <clears throat> you know, I say each and every day, I, 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 I kind of preface it all of my hearings and, and, and my former life, all of my negotiations by talking about the values of, 
uh, New York City workers, particularly the municipal workforce, but all of the New York City workforce. Um, there is a reason why major corporations want to set up shop here in New York. There is a reason why 65 million uh, tourists come to New York City. Uh, is because it is safe, because it is clean, because we have a world-class transportation system, uh, because we have folks that will sacrifice and provide these services no matter when, where, or how, and has nothing to do with the administration, has nothing to do with the council, has to, everything to do with the men and women that provide these critical services on a daily basis. And, and we wanna make sure that they are protected that they have uh, the access and the resources that are absolutely necessary for them to ensure that they can provide their services, but that they can come back to their families safely, right? That we're not sending people out, um, and particularly those who are forced to go out and provide these critical services that don't have the luxury of, of, of working from home, right? Uh, and, and I think that is very important because what we have seen that, that there's a common theme here um, that there are agencies and there are community that, that represent entire cities, but there are communities, particularly communities of color, um, that have been disproportionately impacted, even within individual agencies. So um, uh, this is a, obviously a longer conversation that needs to be had, but we are willing to uh, continue to have those conversations, continue to have these hearings and, and make sure that we are creating a platform and public policy that reflects the needs and values of all New York City workers. I wanna thank all of you for participating. Uh, I wanna thank um, Central staff for the work that they've done. NUSAC has been in, uh, great work. Sergeant at Arms, thank you, thank you uh, all uh, for the work that you have done to my staff, Ali, Brandon, Joe Goldblum, and the rest of the team. Uh, thank you, and to all my colleagues that have joined us. Thank you for all the support that you give to uh, the workers of New York City, and um, the, particularly the Committee on Civil Service and Labor. Uh, thank you for engaging us, uh, supporting us, and allowing us to support workers. So we look forward to working with each and every one of you in the future. With that, uh, my gavel, meeting is adjourned.